Well, I hope we all had some nice holidays. I didn't, because I spent part of them playing Devil's Third. At least I think I did. I also locked myself in a bathroom and ate an entire pound of brandy butter, so it's possible I hallucinated it. It's one of those games I have difficulty believing was made as part of somebody's conscious decisions. It seems like the sort of thing that is spontaneously generated when enough shitty games rub together, like how the brewing process spontaneously generates Marmite. Anyway, it's a Wii U exclusive, which I'm not sure is the right word to use. It implies that this was something so enticing that Nintendo wanted it all to itself, when one suspects it was more of a letting an orphaned puppy in out of the rain and letting it chuck up all over the hearth rug scenario. One suspects the only reason it's on the Wii U is because it's too last gen to hack it on any other console. It's certainly not a natural fit for the Wii audience, since it's sweary and violent and probably won't get any of its characters into Smash Brothers. I know I've been wrong before about that, but this time it's not about tone. It's about sucking shit harder than a colonic irrigation. The quickest possible description for it would be poor man's Metal Gear Solid. And I mean really poor. Like the kind of Metal Gear Solid that was brewed from ketchup packets in a prison toilet. You know how Hideo Kojima's approach to including real world politics and history in his game is to read the first line of the Wikipedia page and then get bored and set a whale on fire, Devil's Third somehow does even less, and seems to have gotten its understanding of the world from what could be barked at it through the door hatch as it was past its morning bowl of gruel. How's this for let's charitably call it misguided? The main character is an inmate in Guantanamo Bay, which in this reality is an underground prison by way of Beyond Thunderdome, populated exclusively by white American Metallica enthusiasts. The protagonist is a stock muscle-bound stoic called Ivan, who's Russian because of course he is, who is enlisted by the American military after a terrorist group sets off an atmospheric EMP blast that shorts out all the world's electrics, except for all the lights and basically everything else. But it throws the entire world into chaos. No, really. We'd be happy to show you some of that chaos, but there's just no time. There's an inexplicably never-ending supply of terrorists that need murdering. The terrorists are part of an organisation called, seriously, SOD. Ivan himself was once a sod but switched sides, having made it through training and induction without realising that terrorist groups kill people. I guess he was sick that day. He must slaughter his way through a parade of former comrades, including the biggest sods of all, the boss fights with poorly explained superpowers. Someone clearly put a lot of thought into the backstory of these lads, and Ivan's prior relationship with them, but in their frothing excitement absentmindedly forgot to actually tell us most of it. Some of the loading screens try to pick up the slack though. Did you know that Pancake Dave gets his powers from the legendary martial art named Raymond Strawberry Trousers? Thank you for letting me know loading screen, but since I killed Pancake Dave three missions ago, I'm not sure why you brought it up. Anyway, I should probably tell you what genre of game Devil's Third is. Well, you can't pin it down as simply as that. It drunkenly meanders between several different rooms of the gameplay house, like it just got in from a bender and can't remember where it left its kebab. It's a hack and slash shooter, military horror, character drama, bad fashion sense simulator, making the classic mistake that a bit of everything creates some kind of sumptuous buffet, when here in the real world, one does not put cola cubes, live bait, and mini baby bells in the same pick and mix bag. Clearly not enough of us gave our lives in the trenches of right to hell retribution for everyone to learn that a brawler and a shooter don't get along in the same space. Both sides of the conflict swiftly discover that attempting to sprint across open ground screaming with sword upraised isn't doing much more than letting armed enemies use your jiggling uvula for target practice. One might reasonably ask why you would ever not use a gun, when the auto target snaps like a hungry shark as long as you aim roughly at the suburb your enemy is located in. The game does have big tough melee dudes that can soak up a lot of bullets and I have fond memories of standing on top of things they couldn't climb, my gunshots forming the gay ribbons of my throbbing maypole as they dance joyously around, impotently menacing the walls of my unmoving plinth. Incidentally, you can climb up some of the walls in Devil's Third, but not all of them. And the best way to figure out which is which is to kidnap one of the developers and hold a gun to their head. Failing that, there's only the scientific method of hurling yourself at every wall you come across like you have fundamentally failed to grasp the concept of a glory hole. But I digress. Why not just use guns when you can mow down an entire column of advancing sword-wielding enemies before they can even begin to regret their choice of villainous specialization? Well, for one thing, ammo's hard to get. Not that it's uncommon, it's lying around all over the fucking place, it's just hard to get. Because the collision physics are so wonky, you have to do a little Mexican hat dance around it before the game wakes up and registers you're trying to pick it up. And the other thing is that only melee attacks increase your power gauge, which lets you activate your Rage of the Gods mode, which presumably in some way helps. It doesn't seem to increase your survival chances if you get caught in a brisk shower of enemy lead, so I'm guessing it ups your damage a bit, which I might have appreciated if most enemies didn't die in one quick volley to the head region. What a bunch of pussies. And also if the game had better AI than a Tamagotchi on low battery mode. The NPCs are still mastering the difference between empty space and large immovable heavy objects. So the gameplay in Devil's Turd feels like Space Filler, a linear string of combat arenas where the enemies seem to have been placed with all the planning and careful thought with which a custard pie is placed in the vicinity of somebody's face. Never evolving because health regenerates and the best weapons are available from the word go, so all you can do is slop around for five hours like a fat prick in secondhand bathwater. But I think what ultimately condemns Devil's Turd, I said it again in case you missed that incredibly hilarious joke the first time, is that it's complete nonsense! First 
or some Duke Nukem-esque lone hero in sunglasses and only missing the singlet because it burst off you in your last flexing session, then suddenly the game is pretending to be a modern military shooter and you're in a unit of American soldiers you're apparently supposed to care about, but whose members come and go like the Megadeth lineup. Then mutant monsters show up for a bit and things turn Resident Evilly before the soldiers all piss off and the game turns into a World War II shooter for like five minutes before the monsters show up again, all over the place doesn't do it justice. That implies there was only one place for it to be all over. This is the Bukaki shoot that got cut short after the participants drowned. Oh boy, I love reviewing new Mario RPGs, taking another opportunity to bang on about how they'll never be as good as Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door never fails to thrill me on an almost erotic level. This time, however, I can do it with added relevance as Mario and Luigi Paper Jam, that's Mario and Luigi Paper Jam bros in the European regions, I wonder if they need to specifically confirm that they're brothers so we don't look for other explanations for why two grown men with German porn star moustaches would spend so much time together, is the crossover between the Paper Mario and Mario and Luigi series is that nobody asked for. Why am I reminded for the second week in a row of an orphaned puppy being let in out of the rain? It's like Nintendo found Paper Mario stuck to the underside of their jackboot one day and they've been trying to think of somewhere to put him ever since. They're making him share a bunk bed with the runty little brother, which is at least an improvement on the Paper Mario sticker star situation when he was being kept in the septic tank. Just re-release Thousand Year Dawn Nintendo for fuck's sake. I promise not to give you more shit than you're currently getting. The premise of Paper Jam is that a magic book gets inevitably disturbed and a swarm of paper characters descends upon the Mushroom Kingdom and everyone gets to meet the alternate paper version of themselves. It's like a stationary themed remake of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Thus is the stage set for a Mario and Luigi game to make its usual two jokes. One, let's all laugh at Luigi for having emotions, and two, boy howdy that princess sure gets kidnapped a lot. Only now it's two princesses, and there's a scene where they're stuck in a cage together where I was absolutely convinced they were about to start lezzing up. So it's another episode in the great Saturday morning cartoon of Mario's live defeat Bowser's rescue princesses, maintain always the status quo, just with a bit more paperwork than usual, hem hem. How the crossover works is that Mario and Luigi contribute the mechanics, visual design controls and general style from their games, while Paper Mario is also there. He's not much more than another tag-along to extend the miniature snake of characters you're parading around the world and to make it even more difficult than it already was to get all of you to jump onto something. They do include a button to make all three jump at once, but that jump isn't high enough to reach most ledges or bonus blocks for no particular reason besides fuck you. Mario and Luigi never spending any time in Paper Mario's world feels like a curious missed opportunity, especially since the last two M and L games have been all about the dual world thing, and especially, especially since Paper Jam is straining so hard to think of new ideas you can practically hear its hernia plop rhythmically in and out. Pressure to perform on stage at the Great Spelling Bee of Creativity, Paper Jam wets its knickers and runs crying to the Mario Comfort Zone, or rather zones. Everyone sing along, Grasslands, Desert, Ocean, Jungle, Ice World, Fire World, Boss. In fact, those are literally the areas we visit in order of progression. It's like a Minecraft map where the biomes are only 12 foot across. I think I've said before, it's always a shame when a Mario RPG goes back to formula when they've been at their best when they indulged ideas outside the everyday kidnap, murder and arson of the Mushroom Kingdom, i.e. climbing up Bowser's rectal passage, and Paper Jam is about as back to formula as it gets, to the point that it's seems to have formula instead of a plot. By which I mean all the usual suspects are arranged in their usual places and then proceed to move about like turds around the floor of a flooded bathroom until events meander their way aimlessly to a climax. So we chase after Bowser and fight underling after underling, the princesses resist each other's womanly charms long enough to plan an elaborate escape that is immediately foiled so one wonders why the game spent so much time building it up. Another inoffensive corporate stooge gets elected to the White House and the world continues inexorably to turn. Every now and again the game remembers Mario RPGs are supposed to be the wacky crazy ones and has characters act out a faintly desperate little comedy skit for our amusement, but it's not the lack of comedy that's the problem, it's the lack of drama. A fairly large portion of the game is spent rescuing paper toads in a variety of hide-and-seek style minigames, but they're just in a flap because they're in a world that can't be threatened with safety scissors and there's nothing specific that they need rescuing from. You could argue that there is afterwards because we immediately sell them into slavery, but more on that later. The main challenge of the game is for me deciding what part of it got the most tedious. For most of it I thought the paper toad gathering was going to take home the gold, but then towards the end I think the combat started putting a very convincing case forward as I braved a seemingly interminable sequence of boss fights that required me to spam my special attacks, all of which take about half an hour of minigames to pull off, and which do fuck all damage if you get the timing wrong because your brain is squeezing the drips from every gland it can reach just to keep you from passing out. Most of the special attacks were either copy-pasted from previous Mario & Luigi games or are similar enough that it makes no odds, but just as the game occasionally remembers Mario RPGs are irreverent and proceeds to embarrass itself on the open mic circuit, it also occasionally remembers that Mario RPGs are experimental and pulls out something like the card battling system, which is too grand a name for a 
a secondary item menu whose contents you don't get to choose. Cards range from the acquire a number of coins equal to your star points divided by your level plus the current market value of nickel, sort of useless, and good ones embodying the eternal gaming paradox, useful, therefore never use. Lastly, most notably, we have papercraft fights. Every now and again the whole turn-based combat 2D RPG thing nips off to the green room for a Gatorade and a wank, while we play a totally disconnected 3D fighting minigame in which characters fling oversized cardboard facsimiles of themselves at each other. It's like trying to play air hockey on a table on which some people are trying to fuck. Like all 3D gameplay in the Soviet dystopia of 3DS world, the one analogue stick per citizen policy means that seeing where the fuck you're going is a decadent capitalist luxury, and for no particular reason you need to do a little rhythm game to get your weapon energy back. Maybe it was some legal necessity like the live music in episodes of The Young Ones, or maybe something ordered by the Un-Nintendo Activities Committee. You can wade ankle deep through shredded cardboard in your sick Thunderdome Bloodsport arena, but you've got to have a little sing-along in between to balance it out. Anyway, the real question for me is how they built these things. All I know is we rounded up a bunch of paper toads and sent them to work in the weapons development lab. Where are they getting all the cardboard for- OH MY GOD YOU MONSTERS! You may have heard, as I did from the gratuitous stabbing murder quarterly digest, that Assassin's Creed is being put to bed for a year so it can stare at its bedroom ceiling through a film of tears and wonder if she's ever coming back. And I was all like, a AAA game publisher acting with a modicum of self-awareness? I'm pretty sure that was in the Book of Revelations somewhere. I'm totally on board with this plan. Fuck, I'll come and tuck Assassin's Creed in if it wants, lay down the rubber sheet in case Assassin's Creed 3 shits the bed again. Of course, within days of saying there won't be an Assassin's Creed game in 2016, Ubisoft perjured itself by releasing an Assassin's Creed Chronicles game, but I guess as an episode 2D Assassin's Creed, it hardly counts as an Assassin's Creed Assassin's Creed, but more like one more bedtime story before we put the light out. And now I've said assassin so many times, the word's gone weird on me. It's got two asses in it, fucking crazy. Ass ass. Sounds like what you'd call somebody's bottom after it got bitten by a radioactive donkey. Anyway, two episodes of Chronicles are out, with a third penciled in for February, I think, and the reason I've chosen to cover them is because I realised after the one-two snorefest of Unity and Syndicate that one of the main things dragging down, I'm bored of saying it now, stabbing enthusiasts' dogma is all of the stuff that isn't stabbing related. If I were interviewing murderers to find a suitable candidate to shiv my ex-wife, it would be of little interest to me whether or not they had any experience in real estate development or collecting the 20 hidden snotty handkerchiefs. What murderers' ideology needs to do is get things back to basics and focus on the ideological murdering. What better way to do that than with a linear 2D platformer? To get so enthusiastic tearing out features that you also lose a dimension somewhere along the way. The first one was set in 16th century China, the second in 19th century India, but it hardly matters. They're both the same plot as usual, assassins and templars both chasing after another magic MacGuffin, shit gets stabbed. So if you are fielding suggestions, Ubisoft, how about a plot that's actually based around how the two groups differ ideologically, rather than yet another gritty violent remake of It's a Mad 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 World? I mean, the whole Sasso Tempo conflict is just he said she said at this point. All ideological movements with no specific end goal inevitably descend into just another group with no purpose except to sustain its own existence and shun the opposition. That's why debating on the internet is like trying to headbutt a brontosaurus to death. Unity sort of gave the game away with its star crossed lovers plot, showing that Sassos and Tempos could find a lot of common ground if they got around a table, and maybe organise some kind of good-natured sports day, but I digress. Chronicles is a stealth platformer somewhat reminiscent of Mark of the Ninja by way of Prince of Persia, so has boiling things down to this level helped get Executioner's Catechism back on track? Has it Brontosaurus, bollocks? I think the problem was the same one I have, making Bolognese, in that they didn't boil it down enough. Trying to keep a three-way gameplay thing going, balancing pure combat, stealth assassinating, or pure stealth, which is hard enough to balance with three dimensions to play with, in two it's like a chimney sweep trying to juggle. The combat really is spectacularly bad. Enemies run up and don't so much stab you as wipe their swords on your midriff, and for most of the game can kill you in two or three wipes. Meanwhile, you can block or you can do a roll thingy to get on their other side, in case your midriff has been wiped enough and you feel it's time you're back at some attention as well. What, you think you could use it to run away? There's only one direction to run in and everyone's got projectile weapons. The button prompt for dodging projectiles is about as reasonable as a hungry shark. The question is, Mr and Mrs Chronicles, what reason is there when an enemy spots me to not just lower my weapon Obi-Wan Kenobi style and let them curb stomp me back to the last checkpoint? The game hits the autosave button every three steps, like Michael J Fox with a TV remote, so I'm not going to lose more time than I'd lose trying to combat my way out, plus the game looms over me constantly with a clipboard, making it abundantly clear with every checkpoint how many points are getting deducted for every time I don't perform at to the standards of Batman in the last 10 minutes of a Batman film. And let's not forget, as I've implied up to this point, the act of playing the combat on a moment-to-moment -moment level is about as fun as trying to free your genitalia from the workings of a grandfather clock. Which may imply that the stealth is more fun than prizing the shreds of the tattered chamois leather that was once your nutsack from between a pair of merciless steel gears, but I assure you no such implication was intended. The enemies have visibility cones the length of your average high street, which have a tendency to suddenly appear or swing around without warning as a character slightly off-screen turns around or unexpectedly comes through a door. So all 
in all, besides a few somewhat open-ended levels, there's not a whole lot to recommend the core gameplay. Of the two episodes thus far, I think I prefer China over India, but then I am a communist. The combat is marginally worse, because the block move requires two controls for no particular reason unless Ubisoft have shares in a thumb injury clinic, but as we've established, getting into combat at all is fucking up, so it doesn't matter so much. China's a bit more focused, with more nice straightforward get to X and stab Y missions, while India has the Assassin's Creed 3 problem of being 99% tutorial, because every other level introduces a new gameplay gimmick that will immediately afterwards get dropped like a sex offender from a parent-teacher association. It's also got a great big curry-scented stiffy for timed levels, most of which also obnoxiously demand perfection, but at least they mainly have the decency to just kill you when you fuck up. They don't try to convince you you could escape from your fuck up because it wants an excuse to beat you up in front of its girlfriend. And finally, you know how Assassin's Creed games always have the in-game encyclopedia to fill in details on characters, places and history? Well I think they must have fobbed that job off onto the intern this time around because the writing's atrocious. It can't seem to get through a paragraph without at least one run-on sentence, and the mix of tenses make me unmixedly tense. One entry I noticed at one point included the phrase way too dangerous. Who the fuck wrote that? The girl from Clueless? Yeah, so like, there were Templars and they totally did bad things and stuff. A highly subjective gripe, I know, but I don't think this industry can afford to let writing standards slip any lower. They're already wheelchair accessible. So in summary, Ubisoft is correct in thinking that Sasso Credo needs to go away and think about what it's done. But my question is, now we've had a Revelations and a Chronicles, could the series go on long enough to eventually use all the subtitle cliches? Fingers crossed for Assassin's Creed Armageddon. I'll freely admit that I wasn't expecting much of Xenoblade Chronicles X. Firstly, it stuck an X either side of its name, like a Counter-Strike player with divorced parents, and then I assumed it was a JRPG, with all that that brings with it. Over-reliance on visual spectacle, horrible gameplay, and incredibly contrived plot. Reading a summary of the previous game, presumably Xenoblade Chronicles W, certainly didn't help. Everybody lives on two giants, and there's a sword that predicts the future, and it was Earth all along. What? But I have to admit, there was something refreshing about Xenoblade Chronicles X. For one thing, it freely admits that the spunky teenage girl character is 13, which does make it a little bit creepy that you can dress her up in swimsuits, but I respect the game for not chickening out and claiming she's 18 in the English translation. It also has a refreshingly straightforward plot. Aliens have blown up the Earth because aliens are bastards. The only surviving human ship crash lands on an alien world, sets up a colony and must gather the fallen bits of the spaceship from the four corners of the planet, or humans might finally die out. Gotcha. A nice solid maypole for all the plots, subplots, and character arcs to dance around. That said, the effort to make sure the plot leaves no one behind starts to wear on me quick like when they mention the Earth getting blown up like 19 times in the first hour. Then there's a mission early on where your support characters go, wait, we should be careful, there's a strong monster ahead, usually these kinds of monsters are not very strong but this one is quite strong indeed. I see, so we should be careful and prepare ourselves for a fight against this strong monster. Sorry, are you really taking five fucking minutes to explain to me the concept of elite monsters? Why are you banging on about this when no one's yet told me where I get my giant robot? Anyway, X-Blade Exicles X is technically a JRPG but it's more accurately an open world game of the kind somewhat peculiar to the Japanese, like Yakuza or Deadly Premonition in which the player character fills the dual role of stolid adventurer hero type and unpaid council surveying officer. Yeah, western open world games love to make you map out the territories one by one, but only the Japanese open world game will make you catalogue every enemy conversation random pickup and blade of grass before it deigns to admit itself to be 100% completed. Xenoblade Chronicles X is a Xenoblade Chronicles exponentially dense game, whose dialogue wastes so much time establishing the patently bloody obvious that it forgets to tell you about half the fucking gameplay mechanics so you have to figure it out yourself by holding your nose and diving into the horribly designed interface. For example, once you map out a region, you can optimise the probe networks to either mine more fuel or earn more money. But I quickly had more of both than I knew what to do with, so I gave less of a shit than the CEO of a major pharmaceutical supplier. You invest in weapon and armour companies to expand their stock, create and upgrade weapon augmentations, which is how you're supposed to use all those random twigs and solidified bunny farts you pick up in the overworld. You're supposed to be upgrading your weapon attacks and skills from the menu, and you have to do that for everyone you take on as a party member because apparently no one can pull up their big girl petticoats unless you specifically tell them to, it's all very unintuitive and you get to do all of this while listening to the same four or five music tracks until you want to find whatever hip hop artist coined the practice of going uh, uh, yeah in place of lyrics and push a small volume of Shakespearean sonnets down his windpipe. The combat reminds me of Dragon's Dogma in that you can hire other players' avatars as NPC support. They aren't being controlled by another player but then they don't need to be. The combat could be done just as well by a fucking adding machine. It's very memorpaguri, you've got a suite of attack icons and it's mainly about using them in the right order to maximise efficiency. Here's one that staggers the enemy, here's one that does extra damage to staggered enemies, not exactly particle physics, but while technically real time, it's totally numbers based, so attackers do the Final Fantasy thing of vaguely waving their weapons in the vicinity of the attackee, and whether or not they appear to be close enough is a supremely academic matter, which makes it hard to run away from battles when you stumble onto something 30 levels higher, the size of the double decker bus that just ploughed through the brick shithouse, which happens all the fucking time because the relation between the levels of monsters and at what point in the game you access the areas they hang around is an estranged one at best. Putting a level 60 elite monster in the 
middle of a linear path you're forced to go down for a level 20 story quest is a total Richard relocation, that is to say, dick move. So far I'm probably giving the impression that I'm down on this game, but I've played it for like 30 hours, so either there's something I like about it or I'm severely mentally ill. Let's not dwell on that. The scenery is nice, and you'll have plenty of time to appreciate it as you sprint around it trying to find the path that takes you to the next fucking probe. I like that there's a minimum side questing requirement for the next story mission so you've got a chance to explore, and I like how the side quests usually have a narrative aspect that fleshes out characters and aren't just filling out checklists. Might have been even better if most of the characters hadn't been boring assholes and the ones that weren't boring hadn't been more irritating than a mouth ulcer during a sherbet lemon eating contest. A bit of interpersonal conflict between main characters wouldn't have gone amiss, but nope, it's just cartoonishly evil villains and everyone else lives in a great big Mormon Boy Scout camp. Oh thank you for teaching me this lesson in duty and friendship, licky licky botty botty. In fact, you know what, the main thing that kept me going was seeing how long it was going to take before the game would finally give me the fucking giant robot advertised on the box. For most of it it was like I was hinting to my parents what I wanted for Christmas and the game was just going, well maybe if you're very good the giant robot fairy will visit someday. You want to know how long it took? 24 hours in, 6 or 7 story chapters. Fuck me, the Spanish Inquisition wouldn't tease you for that long. It came without warning. Hey, said the commander dude out of nowhere. Isn't it time you had your giant robot license? To which I replied, yes, fuck, yes, fuck, fuck, yes, fuck. Fair enough, all you have to do is complete eight side quests. You know, I understand the principle that satisfaction grows the more work we have to put into it, but at this rate the giant robot could have been made from chewed up Lego and my spooge would still have blasted my trousers off. But I powered on through, I did those quests, I killed the monsters, I scoured the land for the fetch quest items, I worked every shaft and tickled every ball, and finally my hard work paid off. 25 hours and I had a giant robot to call my very own. Gleefully I took it for a spin around the overworld, leaping, dancing, turning into a car, stepping on the toes of a level 60 elite monster, and getting destroyed in one hit. Well, that was an anti-climax. No, wait. This is an anti-climax. The Witness is a new game by Jonathan Blow. Ironically, it sucks. <laughs> Obnoxious laugh. It's a first-person puzzle game inspired by Myst in that you're a faceless dork on a mysterious island that was bought by the Disney Corporation in the 70s, but they never quite figured out what they were going to do with it. So now you roam the partially constructed castles and pirate ships while occasionally sitting down to fill out a puzzle from the back of a cereal box. Of course, the thing about Myst and the walking simulator genre is that there's usually some kind of story going on to make you want to keep going, and I'm not saying The Witness doesn't have a plot, but if it does, it's like a single balloon tied to the corpse of a sperm whale. I didn't finish if it's anything like Braid, Jonathan Blow's other game, the story bits that tie everything together and reveal what the point of the whole thing was probably come at the end, but I wouldn't know. Hold up a Mars bar at the far end of an obstacle course of broken glass and pictures of my parents fucking, and I won't care if it's the most sumptuous Mars bar the factory ever crafted. By the end I'm just gonna walk straight past it and knee you in the fucking bollocks. The game boasts over 500 puzzles, and I very much believe it. What it fails to mention is that these are over 500 iterations of the same puzzle, which involves drawing a line around a grid in order to satisfy a variety of esoteric conditions, which the game is frequently very bad at explaining, because I guess written instructions are the shackles of the man, man, but if you do figure them out then they guide you through the paths of the mysterious overworld which is, let's be fair, very pretty in a hotel room artwork with the saturation turned up sort of way. There's a bit of an invisible wall pandemic, but there's a bold use of contrasting colours and I like the water effects particularly. The trouble is that most of the puzzles don't integrate with the lovely environments at all. Yeah, you can dangle your feet in this babbling brook and enjoy the sunlight playing off the flowers, but at some point you're gonna have to get up and gormlessly stare at a piece of graph paper someone nailed to the wall, and figure out how to draw a line that separates all the coloured squares, creates a space shape like a Tetris block, and disappears up the bum of a cartoon horse. It's like wandering around Disneyland with a book of word searches. Oh, the mean old puzzles hurt Yahtzee Boo Boo's fragile little gamey brainy Wayne. Perhaps he'd be more suited to the kind of puzzle where you only draw straight lines connecting a shotgun barrel to a foreign insurgent's left testicle. Hey, twat finder general, I solved the puzzles, I just wasn't having fun doing so. I completed the whole island, turned on all the laser beams, opened up the mountain to what I suspect was the final climactic area, and then the game threw 15 more line drawing puzzles at my face and frankly fuck that. Congratulations on getting through that bowl of dog food, player. Here's your reward, another helping of dog food. And another thing, whatever visionary artistic benefit one gets from a complete lack of music, a small amount of testing should have revealed probably wasn't worth it. Silence is good for atmosphere building up to a certain point, but the silence in Witness starts weighing on me like a granite fizz, and not in a fun Silent Hill oppressive sort of way, more the if I don't alt tab out and put on some music or a podcast I am going to fall asleep so hard that the space bar will get embedded in my face like an impromptu Groucho Marx disguise. So in summary, get the witness if you genuinely can't ever do enough cereal box maze puzzles. Personally, I'm more of a junior jumble man. So speaking of jumblies, let's go about as far along the tone spectrum as we can for our next game. Hey, Yate, said Steam towards the end of the week, do you remember that announcement trailer you saw a while back for a game called Bombshell? I do indeed, it was one of the worst trailers I've ever seen. I think they made it by gluing poser models together with cold spunk. 
Oh, well the game's out now. P.T. fucking keen! Bombshell is a top-down shooter with a somewhat retro air to it, published by 3D Realms of all people, the Duke Nukem lads, so maybe one could think of this as their penance for all those female characters in Duke Nukem whose sole contribution to the experience was breasts optionally attached to their bodies. Because Bombshell has a female protagonist. Way to prove those feminazi haters wrong, 3D Realms. Although just to be safe, maybe you should play up the fact she's a woman another six or seven million times. Bombshell champions the strong female character in that utterly cringeworthy way that makes me slightly nostalgic for PC gaming in the 90s. So of course she's an unflappable badass who's effortlessly better than all the boys, and bubbles constantly with non-specific rage, and the fact that she's a woman is the central if not only element of her identity. The single fact that tells you everything you need to know is that she uses a rocket launcher called the PMS. Wow, that's some next level shit there. Suppose we should be grateful it wasn't hot pink and fired Sex in the City DVDs. Anyway, Bombshell journeys through a portal to an alien world in order to save the president from invading aliens. Better keep that Oscar for best screenplay on hand. The president's also feeling female and identical in personality to Bombshell because coming up with one strong female archetype used up half the budget and Bombshell's tits took care of the rest. But let's get off this topic because I can sense the gender politics vultures circling, and frankly I couldn't give two sucks on your mum's fat titties how positive a role model Bombshell presents for young women with rocket launchers if the game's fun, and it isn't. Again I found myself reaching for the alt tab to find a podcast, although in this case it wasn't for lack of sound, it was to drown out the fucking awful quips Bombshell throws out on a per second basis. How many aliens does it take to change a light bulb? Ooh, I think I know this one, Bombshell. Is it the same as the last 27 times you asked? You twat! It also helped pass the time when I was plodding through samey maps tracking side quest objectives because the game persists in the delusion that it's an RPG, even though the weapon and stat upgrades are less significant than a pubic louse in a cancer ward. I'd suggest skipping the side quest, but unfortunately the map doesn't differentiate between which vague indicator marks the main quest and which the optional ones, so get ready to backtrack like a politician suddenly noticing a live mic. As for the action itself, if you shoot monsters they usually respond by falling over, so that's one star at least, but the game has a strange obsession with making you jump over instant death chasms, which in a top-down isometric perspective incorporates a high-stakes game of guess the distance. The interface layout is horrible, with the extremely vital health percentage that tells you when you're about to die, tucked away in tiny whiny font between your cup size and tampon inventory. I think the moment I knew my opinion wasn't going to change was after I died a few times to a boss monster with a strong resemblance to a huge spiny tentacled cock. Maybe that's just my interpretation, but I think it's a point against the game if it can't even distract me from the phantom penis monsters. Gravity Rush is a game first released in 2012 that at the time nobody played. Oh don't be so hyperbolic Yahtzee, you know full well it was a PlayStation Vita exclusive. I beg your pardon, Gravity Rush is a game first released in 2012 that at the time nobody played except for some mad people. I did hear the game was alright, but I wasn't gonna buy a fucking PS Vita to play it. That'd be like adopting an incontinent chimpanzee because you fancy the lady who comes around to change his nappies. Thankfully, a remastered version of Gravity Rush came out last week for the PS4, which I very much appreciate because I'm sick of all this mad people privilege in modern society. They get all these exclusive games, they hog all the fun medications, and there seems to be a whole bunch of them running for president at the moment. Anyway, Gravity Rush is a sort of Japanese take on the superhero sandbox genre, and broadly resembles what you'd get if Infamous had been directed by Jean-Pierre Genet. It is also probably the only game you'll ever play in which the central character is a flying homeless person. If not, then it's definitely the only game about a flying homeless person who dresses like a slag. In a weird fantasy floating city where constant magic storms and attacks by weird blobby monsters are doing catastrophic things to house prices, a strange girl wakes up with no memory and equipped with the following things. A magic cat made of Vegemite, the ability to manipulate gravity in a small area around herself, and a renaissance fair burlesque dancer's outfit. She sets out on an epic quest to discover the truth about herself, which she abandons almost immediately because she got distracted by a shiny object. Seriously, the plot must have been written by the kind of person who gets bored halfway through reading a stop sign, because it feels like the game brings up a new plot thread every ten minutes and never ties any of them up. By the end they're all left swaying in the breeze like the phrase of the poorly knitted sweater the main character sorely needs to put on. I'll spoil right now that we never find out who the fuck the amazing homeless stripper is, or where she came from, and she doesn't seem to care. Her first priority is to set up home in a sewer tunnel, and then start hanging around in the car park of a home depot looking for odd jobs. She does some work with the police, the army, she becomes a maid at one point. Is this a story or a series of contrived excuses to put on fetish outfits? Oh, I think you know. As I said, there's monsters, we never figure out where they come from. Wait, this one was trying to protect someone, is there more to them than meets the eye? No, move on. Look, there's another homeless stripper with gravity powers, perhaps she knows who we really are. She doesn't. Oh. Well, did we both get gravity powers from the same source? Probably, who cares? Now there's a mysterious master thief antagonising us who seems to know something about our past. Oh, he's dead. Never mind. Oh no, the city's been taken over by a fascist military state. What could their sinister plan be? Is it to weaponize the mo- It's to weaponize the monsters. How did you guess? Other than it being the video game fascist military state default setting. So the final climactic showdown is with a monster that was introduced two minutes beforehand. But wait, the deposed fascist military leader knows something about your past. Great, what is it? Hey, we've got to leave something for the sequel, haven't we? I do find the characters and setting endearing in a 
city of lost children with the anime turned up to a billion kind of way, but the story's all set up and no payoff. It's like trying to masturbate to the first season of Lost. How the flying works is that you push a button to shift gravity to the direction you're looking in, so you don't so much fly as plummet in specific directions. Whatever surface your new bile young body smashes into at terminal velocity becomes your new floor, which can get slightly annoying if you hit a lamppost or something and end up tightrope walking over the abyss that is Main Street, though frankly if you do hit a wall you're doing it wrong. Despite the main title image being of the heroine standing on a wall, there's not a whole lot of tactical usage to standing on walls, unless you're trying to teach the third person camera the essentials of ballroom dancing. It's a lot more expedient to keep switching gravity before you hit things and stay in the air. But having said that, the gravity switching controls could be more efficient. In fact they could be precisely 100% more efficient because you have to press the button twice to change the direction of gravity where I feel once would have done. The first press cancels all gravity and puts you into hover mode, the second picks the new gravity. It's like having to stop the car and put it in neutral before you can change gear, and your car dresses like a whore. The combat is, well it's certainly there. Monsters appear usually for flimsy reasons and you have to hit them in the traditional obvious glowing weak spot, again remaining on whatever currently passes for the ground is a mugs game because hitting the weak spots calls for accuracy that is found wanting in standard kicks and jump kicks. I just stayed in the air and used the gravity shifting dive kicks, speeding towards targeted weak points, missing and disappearing over the horizon as if only just now realising that I didn't put my trousers on this morning. The combat works when it becomes this sort of aerial ballet about finding the right angle of attack but fails to develop from there. None of the bosses are particularly hard once you have the dive kick down. There's a couple of super powered attacks that range from a more damaging version of dive kick to complete waste of energy that would have been better spent flicking bogeys at the enemy. On that note you can also throw physics objects, which is the most pointless and awkward to use ability of them all, don't even bother. There are some challenges based around it which are like asking a butcher to challenge himself for five minutes by replacing his knife with a drinking straw. What's worth noting about the combat is that monsters never show up in free roam, only at predetermined points in missions. It's almost like the combat doesn't integrate terribly well as a core mechanic and is being thrown in as an arbitrary challenge whenever we remember we're supposed to be a video game. At the end of the day Gravity Rush can't boast great design nor much of a sandbox given the shortage of missions and that you could drive around the whole world in ten minutes, and that includes the break for sandwiches, and even then there are entire sections of the world the game will do maybe one thing with and forget about, possibly because the game had to keep cutting its arms and legs off until it could squeeze into a handheld. But there's a certain charm to it, the story element feels like a basket of individual kittens loosely tied in place with string, but the highlight of the game is a mission that starts with an innocuous fetch quest and turns into a years long odyssey to the end of the universe, and a game with tighter control of itself probably couldn't have done that. It's like Willy Wonka fucking nails the childlike wonder thing but you wouldn't put him in charge of the company's sports day. So a couple of years back there was a game I quite liked called XCOM about aliens in the process of conquering the Earth. There's a new game called XCOM 2 about aliens having already conquered the Earth, now we just need a prequel about the aliens getting ready to conquer the Earth, cancelling the newspapers, locking up the house and putting on their space wellies, and the verb to conquer will be fully conjugated. Twenty years have passed since the last game, the Earth has come under the control of an oppressive alien regime fronted by a dorky human collaborator, and when the silent protagonist gets released from suspended animation the resistance can finally get started, because no one was willing to get off their arse and defend themselves without the presence of this one gormless mute. But enough about the plot of Half-Life 2, let's talk about XCOM 2 instead. The game opens with a tutorial mission in which the nameless, voiceless, faceless commander is rescued from the alien's CRISPR drawer, but I thought the commander was me, the player, the one giving the orders. So when the game goes, the commander's being held captive in an alien fortress, I reply, no I'm not, I'm sitting on this couch scratching my balls and eating a zooper duper. Soon enough we get back into the XCOM groove with a base, a research budget and an elite fighting unit consisting of a handful of untrained part-time gym teachers in second-hand body armour. And since no one had ever heard of Dropbox in the first game, we have to research the monsters and alien weapons all over again, even though this could have been done at any point in the last two decades by looking out of the fucking window, or at the owner of the boot currently stomping on your face. You might think this is starting to sound like they made XCOM again with just enough veneer of originality to call it a sequel, in which case you're mostly right. Well, well done, here's your slightly incomplete trophy. You might also think that since I liked XCOM 1 I'd be perfectly on board with XCOM Another One, and now you're not so right, better give me that trophy back. The risk-free, copy-paste sequel carries risks of its own, but what was good and exciting when it was new sparks quickly and fades over time whereas what's bad and annoying sticks around, like an unemployed couch-surfing friend with access to your Netflix account. The game still features that annoying constant sensation that every decision we make has in some way fucked over our entire game forever, and I swear the random number generator has it in for me. These 95% chances to hit melee attacks seem to miss a hell of a lot more than 5% of the time, and now my melee guy's out in the open, standing next to an angry monster and forgot to bring a change of tighty whities But let's focus on the differences. There's a bit more of an emphasis on the character editor that lets you create a pool of 
wacky funsters for the game to randomly pick as soldiers and VIPs, which I suggest using because the random characters the game creates on the fly don't seem to have any sense of fun at all. There's all kinds of funny hats and Dame Edna spectacles to go around, but all the game produced for me was dudes with male pattern baldness and ladies with granny haircuts. Loosen the fuck up, guys. Our comrades in the field are dying for your right to dress like a complete tosser. Secondly, you don't have access to the whole world from the get-go. You have to gradually expand your secret underground resistance, whose headquarters are in a very secret and underground giant airborne helicarrier, so UFO invasions aren't a thing anymore. They'd be a bit redundant at this point. Now the random missions are all aliens are being dicks somewhere, time to load up the circumcision wagon. What's new to the turn-based combat missions is that there's a stealth element now. You can be a bit less cautious advancing forward because aliens don't immediately know where all your troops are because your last guy with a turn left noticed two fifths of a sectoid armpit through the image of a window reflected off the tears of a dying sparrow. Now your troops are in a concealed state until they get within a certain distance of the enemy. Because let's not forget that we're a sneaky guerrilla resistance group now, as we put on our suits of armour and get helicoptered into the middle of a busy pedestrian precinct. It's just a one-time thing though, the moment one of your dude's elbows pokes into range, the aliens go back to knowing every tree, ice cream van and public convenience your lads are hiding in. Might have made some sense to go back into concealment mode once every alien in the current vicinity is dead and the rest are all across town at the company picnic, but apparently not. I guess the enemy remotely inform each other that you're around or something. X comma here, that's a bugger. Hmm? Can we come over and help kill them? Love to, but we just started the barbecue and you're a whole hundred yards away. The concealment thing doesn't make a whole lot of sense in certain timed missions. Recover the contents of a box in enemy territory within eight turns or it'll detonate. Hold on one second there, Charlie. We start this mission concealed, so the enemy don't know that we're here, but they rigged their own stuff to explode regardless. Do they just like keeping the storage guys on their toes? It seems like there are quite a lot of timed missions in XCOM 2, and they never fail to annoy because it's taking away what the stealth offers, the chance to take your time and be a bit more thoughtful with your approach without a little monkey banging symbols next to your ear because the bananas aren't coming fast enough. But let's save some negativity for our next steaming hate fuck. I quite like some of the new base management elements, especially how the engineers can be individually assigned to specific rooms, because it reminds me of playing FTL, a slightly more fun game. I like how the map exploring and rookie training facility makes it feel like we're less reliant on the twiddle our thumbs and hope for the best management strategy, but I still somehow feel less engaged by XCOM 2 than its predecessor. Part of that might be the sloppy second sequel syndrome, but there are other things that bug me, such as the bugs, the graphical glitches, the shooting at what is blatantly a different enemy to the one I said to shoot at, the weird lag that has no business existing in a game that isn't online, nor in orbit around one of the moons of Saturn. But I think what bothers me most is that the premise is fundamentally poorly thought out. Verisimilitude is a word that comes to mind that's quite difficult to spell. The role reversal of the aliens in command and the humans being the insurgents is not reflected in any significant gameplay change. It's still us, the humans, getting sent out to hunt down the creepy crawlies, and the notion that aliens are accepted by the masses as benevolent overseers while mostly consisting of hissy monsters is pretty absurd. They make a big thing of how they use armoured soldiers that pass for human to hide their true nature, but the effort seems kinda wasted the first time you see them on patrol with monsters. I just don't think people would accept a giant snake as the new local constable. Good morning, PC hissy. <laughs> I'm very well, thank you, PC Hissy. How's the brood? I'm not saying video gamers have become a sedentary bunch, but 20 years ago simulators were forgetting a taste of life as an Olympic athlete or daring heroic pilot, whereas now most of them seem to be about being someone who's capable of getting up off the couch and bumming around the house. So let's talk walk. Ing. Simulators. Let's not fall into the trap of saying walking simulators keep popping up because they're lazy. Actually, they're a bold new form of storytelling that are coincidentally much, much easier to make than a game with actual gameplay, in the same way that it's really easy to make a bread sandwich. Let's do something we haven't done in a while and put the two most recent walking simulators head to head. Firewatch, a dramatic character-based experience set against the backdrop of watching fires, and Layers of Fear, a spooky horror set against the backdrop of horrific spookiness that just came off early access. Quick question, who the fuck buys a story-based experience on early access? access, getting the whole thing spoiled for you while it's still crap. Um, it's about supporting creators, Yard, so you wouldn't understand. Now excuse me while I eat this handful of dry spaghetti. One. Premise. Firewatch follows the adventures of Henry, a stubby Zach Galifianakis lookalike who takes a job as a lookout at a national park in order to escape from the difficulties of his life and forms a verbal relationship with his supervisor as a mysterious intrigue develops. Meanwhile, the premise behind Layers of Fear is, isn't it a shame Silent Hills got cancelled? It's essentially the playable teaser for Silent Hills stretched out to an entire house, not just two rooms of it. You're a tortured artist alone in your spooky mansion and it's swiftly hinted there was a wife and child at some point. So yeah, you probably murdered them or ate them or strapped them to the couch and forced them to watch televised snooker until they lost the ability to reason. And that's why you're now haunted by visions of men wearing very tacky waistcoats. So if we're rewarding points, I'll give the first impression prize to Firewatch because it's not immediately clear what it's building up to. If you're in for horror or drama or just two middle-aged hairy outdoors people sexting each other all summer, whereas Layers of Fear immediately looks like we got on the Haunted Mansion ride at Disneyland. 2. Walking 
Wouldn't be much of a walking simulator without it, we're saving the sitting on the couch simulator for when the average BMI goes up again. So Henry's task is to wander around the park, completing the objectives that his boss gives him, which range from go to a place and look at a thing, to look at a place and go to a thing. But that's only if you're one of those tiresome squares who see life as nothing more than a to-do list. You can also explore the park freely and look for secret things, which is the to-do list for cool people. The main purpose of walking in layers of fear is to bum around the room inspecting the furniture until something spooky happens, after which you leave the room by the door you came in, except now it leads to a different room because illogical architecture is spooky. Well, before it's happened 90 bloody times anyway, and then it just becomes the new logic. And it would have been spookier if the doors went back to being sensible, because then I'd suspect they were up to something. Still, I did notice that our protagonist walks with a limp, which was a neat little background storytelling detail, but then I wondered why I was noticing something like that, and concluded it was because I'd explored 300 identical drawing rooms and was more bored than a lesbian at a sausage festival. 3. What grudgingly passes for gameplay. Both Layers of Fire and Fear Watch make the usual half-hearted burbling sound that walking simulators make for want of a challenge, that being find all the documents the kind of challenge one can enjoy at a fraction of the cost by spending the afternoon tidying your home office. Firewatch spices it up with find all the conversations, as you eagerly radio in to report every bit of scenery and discarded rubber Johnny. Otherwise, Layers of Fear's main challenge is to summon the courage to keep playing in the face of an endless sequence of cheap jumps and scares, which aren't difficult to predict after a while. There is no end to the game's fascination with making things happen behind you. At one point the words don't look back appeared on a wall, then there was a creepy noise behind me, and I could almost smell the game's disappointment as I ignored it completely and kept walking. Firewatch Watch's more open-ended presentation lends itself to orienteering gameplay, which became a lot more interesting after I found the option to turn off the map marker showing precisely where you are, but I only found it during the second run-through, and by then I'd bummed around the park enough that it was as familiar to me as my home office, although with slightly less organic life growing in it. 4. Payoff Firewatch's dialogue-based storytelling did draw me in, there's a lot of character to it, and quite a lot of variation based on what order you do things and how much about Henry's personal life you reveal to the voice in the box. It must be jolly complicated, as evidenced by the occasional fart, like when the lady started yelling about finishing her crossword halfway through the deepest point of the scary intrigue, but I found myself disappointed by the explanation of the mystery at the end. Oh, all mysteries are disappointing once explained, Yate. That's why no one listens when you explain that the Loch Ness Monster was your granddad doing the backstroke with his knob out. I know, but it didn't help that the main explanation was given on a very poor quality tape recording so I could only make out half the words. That's part of the reason I went through it a second time, to put the fucking subtitles on for that bit, and also to see if the actual events of the plot change at all if you pick different dialogue choices and actions, the short answer being like, fuck they do so the overall payoff is a profound feeling of anticlimax. Meanwhile, in Layers of Fear, it turns out your wife's dead and you're probably in hell or something. Bloody typical. Am I right, fellas? 5. Conclusion The problem with Firewatch is it's the kind of game where I'll say I don't like it because X, and everyone will say X is the whole point! I'd say it looks alright and the dialogue is strong if occasionally hovering around the city limits of sarcastic clever clogs Joss Whedon Town, but I left feeling underwhelmed because nothing much happened and what did happen didn't mean anything, and they'll say, ooh, that's the point, it's a meditation on the futility of escaping the petty miseries of modern life. Yeah, but I could get the same feeling from immersing my head in a bowl of water and my doctor told me to stop doing that! As for Layers of Fear, like PT, it's not much more than a show case of spooky set pieces, but PT never claimed to be a complete game. Makes me think of Evil Within, you try to make an entire game out of a delusional nightmare sequence and it gets boring because it never lets up and the nightmare becomes the norm. Bid us to sit down and pull the chair away as we do so, but don't keep doing it. Do it once, then apologise, let us sit for a while, wait till we're calm, then throw spiders at our face and burn the house down. That's what I do and I've never heard complaints. No coherent ones, anyway. This really is one of those occasions that highlights the gulf between video game critics and their audience, besides the fact that we're immeasurably sexier. I could sit here on my sexy ass complaining that Ubisoft have hacked out another addition to one of their franchises that plays pretty much the same as the previous, only now it's wearing a different hat, but most people seem to think, who cares? It's not like we're under obligation to play every game that comes out and disproportionately demand novelty, for the sake of getting through another week without jamming a steel bracket through our eye sockets and turning ourselves into a human coat rack. That's a small, admittedly sexy minority of weirdos. Maybe Ubisoft are just catering to normal, boring, un attractive people who like Far Cry just fine as it is but could go for seconds. The thing is, hypothetical speaker, that if it's just Far Cry you want then Far Cry 3 has yet to be topped and hasn't gone anywhere. It's even got quite a good plot, the occasional titty. So there's got to be some shriveled part of you that expects novelty or they wouldn't need to keep bringing out new ones in different settings. There, I win the argument, now piss off, you're getting straw all over the place. Far Cry Primal, aka The Land Before Plots, turns the Far Cry modern person in wilderness connects with violent primitive inner self thing on its head somewhat by being about a violent primitive outer self in the wilderness 
wilderness connecting their big heavy club with the skulls of rival tribe members. Set in Central Europe in a time when the world was a lot smaller, judging by the way it can be an entirely different fucking season if you walk north for half an hour, our hero is Takar, a nondescript caveman who sounds a bit like Adam Jensen reading aloud from a Scandinavian phrase book. His entire tribe is wiped out by a vicious saber-toothed tiger and he finds himself in a lush new territory in which he must unite the scattered remnants of his tribe and genocide the fuck out of the other two tribes that are trying to claim it, who don't deserve it as much as our tribe because of self-evident reasons. I suppose I can't hold out much hope for identifiable characters when we're dealing with a cast of Neanderthals who will never know the pain of soft toilet paper tearing halfway through the wipe, but you're in the wrong place if you're looking for an engaging plot, or indeed any plot. You might think the shit I've described so far constitutes a plot, but you'd be wrong. The killer saber-toothed tiger that sparks off the adventure we kill later on as one of the big hunt missions without even much prominence. I ousted both the rival tribes, who I'll just reiterate we aren't given much reason to oppose except that they'd also quite like to survive the winter, but the game still didn't end. This is the game that Ubisoft sandboxes have been tacitly threatening to turn into for quite some time now, one where all sense of structure or progress is kept as vague as possible for want of turning the game into a platform for a series of disconnected events and repetitive challenges. I suspect because it's easier for the inevitable fucking DLC to slot into like a bloodstained erection. But you know what, I'm with you Ubisoft, who needs some uppity creative trying to dictate to me how to experience their creation? I mean where do the creators of Breaking Bad get off telling me I should watch season 1 before season 2? Oh because I quote, won't understand what's going on, you don't know me! And who does this Shakespeare motherfucker think he is, putting the pages in numbered order? I am the master of my domain, I choose to shuffle them all up and read the text from right to left. Maybe I'm experiencing sandbox fatigue, but when upcoming characters and plot elements are given away on loading screens and by looking at the locked items on the upgrade menu, something's gotten fucked up. Anyway, it's Far Cry, so you know what that means, animal hunting and assaulting enemy camps. There's a pretty big emphasis on crafting, the mechanic which is to modern games what influenza was to the early 20th century, but perhaps it's fitting since you're a caveman and crafting is their whole thing, besides swinging clubs and putting their dicks in things. You pretty much have to pick up every resource you see if you want to stay on top of all the hut building and weapon improving. Incidentally, I'd recommend turning off gathering animations, because the first person camera lurching down to pat dead cavemen on the body starts to give me a headache, but maybe sometimes I don't want to run around body patting, maybe I just want to ride my saber-toothed tiger through a forest. Oh yeah, you can tame animals, which is sort of the compensation for not having guns, because rather than sniping all the guards from a nearby hill, you just deploy a giant bear and throw bees at the survivors. You don't fuck around in my hundred acre wood. Hey, remember in Far Cry 4 they had those hallucinatory missions where you played a primitive warrior with animal friends? It's the same thing they did when they threw the ship missions into Assassin's Creed 3, where it was totally vestigial and barely connected to the rest of it, but also a secret proof of concept for Ass Creed 4. Ubisoft games all sprawl over each other now like an incestuous farming cult. Anyway, as tends to be the case with Far Cry, the variety of approaches means you'll inevitably gravitate to one that totally breaks the game and boredom swiftly follows. For me, it was throwing berserk bombs from my scouting owl. The enemy can't do shit about your scouting owl because their huge Neolithic foreheads means they can't look up. Once you unlock the ability to drop bombs from your owl, you just find a guy in the enemy stronghold with the shield icon that indicates he has boosted health to a frankly ridiculous degree, drop a berserk bomb on him, then find a nice bush to hide in while the enemy work things out among themselves. Get it right and you'll only have to deal with one very tired elite enemy with 400 spears stuck in his bum. I stopped playing Far Cry Primal because nearly all the missions were done except for three hunts against special super predators and great big loincloth displacing bollocks to those. I went into the first one and spent half an hour doing a giant scale join the dots puzzle looking for the fucking thing. Use your hunter senses to pick up the beast's trail. I'm trying objective list but it would help if you'd stop turning my hunter sense off every five fucking seconds. You like my dad with the fucking thermostat. Anyway, I found the killer tiger and the fight began. After several rounds of traps, spears and throwing smaller tigers at it, it had lost an entire third of its health, at which point it went bored now, took its ball and went home. Better wait till the following night to continue this, advised the game. Be fair, he needs some time to think about his choices in life. Three times this happened before I finally wore him down, but it was worth it because then I could tame him. Just wait till the enemy gets a load of this monster, I thought, before I unleashed him on one of the dudes with the shield icons who killed him in three hits. You know, Mr. Tiger, I took a risk hiring you, but you're just not living up to the potential you showed in the interview. I only stabbed you 97 times for God's sake, some companies don't go below 100. Stardew Valley is a retro-style farming simulator recently released on Steam that's somewhat reminiscent of Harvest Moon. Oh sorry, I read that wrong. Stardew Valley is Harvest Moon. It murdered Harvest Moon, stole Harvest Moon's skin and befriended Harvest Moon's parents under the guise of consoling them in their hour of grief. Same visual style, same tile-based crop growing, same animal rearing, same day-night, four-season, three-year cycle, same relationship mechanic where you seduce the local hotties by sprinting up and shoving berries in their face twice a week. It is one of the 16-bit Harvest Moon games, if it were quite a bit bigger in scope and had a crafting element. And you know what that means? Time to smelt some fucking 
iron. If I gathered up all the iron I've ever smelted in crafting games, I could build a giant statue to the god of wasting my fucking time. Also, Harvest Moon never had pixel art that blended multiple sizes of pixel resolution, which never fails to look like a packet of fried bum holes. Maybe I'm a little bit bitter because I somehow clocked up 50 hours on this game in the course of one week and I could have used some of that time to do chores or eat food. You see, Harvest Moon was always good at hitting my addiction receptors. It's probably something to do with following a daily routine in the service of gradually building up to bigger and better things. Or maybe it's the way little hearts appear above a cow's head as we stand behind it making very suspect gestures until white liquid squirts out. The scope of Stardew Valley is a bit intimidating at first. You're given a field full of weeds and sticks and told that your first job is to introduce yourself to all 28 residents of this maze-like town who are all in different locations and constantly moving. But think of it as a game world that you grow into. Don't worry about making friends with all 28 of them straight away. For one thing, only 10 of them are on your knobbing radar. Calm thy trousers, Don Juan. Just clear a little space and try to grow some parsnips and the next thing you know, 50 hours have passed and the missing persons bureau have written you off for dead. If you are a 100% completion nutter, then you're going to need a spreadsheet and a lobotomy, but I just took things as they came, did enough to make progress, and concentrated on seducing the one girl in the next field over who was happy with being given flowers I found in the dirt outside her house. Mind you, I was only doing it to tick marriage off the checklist. There's not much that differentiates the town's eligible spunk receptacles besides hairdos and what two-line dialogue they quote day after fucking day. Why do people only like us more if we give them material goods? What is this, village of the ultra-capitalists? Can't there be characters who grow to admire us from afar for our firm outdoorsman's physique and faint smell of cow plops? Stardew Valley got me temporarily hooked, but then so did Crystal Meth and I'm not entirely sure I'd recommend either. The gamepad support is for absolute shit. In Stardew Valley, I mean. Gamepad support for Crystal Meth was perfectly alright after the day one update. And the controls are overall kinda wonky. Keep something handy to bite down upon for the first time you accidentally plough a ten day old patch of eleven day melons. It's frightening how a routine and the promise of eventual almost certainly disappointing reward can condition one's mind. A duck feather probably doesn't sound like treasure, but when it's the only item I need to complete a special item collection and I've got a coop full of ducks staying stubbornly attached to their feathers for five fucking seasons, this is probably the environment in which duck religion starts. So let's move on to the diametric opposite of Halved You Moon Valley. It's an entirely new gameplay concept. You murder instead of befriending everyone and it was finished after about two hours. Super hot. A first person arena type shooter in which time only moves when you move. Which is an immediately intriguing idea, isn't it? So it's a shame I have to start qualifying it now. Time does move a little bit. So even standing still you're in trouble if bullets are crawling towards you in their bullet wheelchairs. Still, you don't want the pace to drop completely, I suppose. Super hot reminds me of Hotline Miami. And Hotline Miami would have lost something if you'd been able to stop dead in the middle of a frenzied death battle to have a quick sandwich and a poo. Where Hotline Miami compensated for its massively unfair combat with the ability to die and respawn approximately four times per second, Super Hot's slow time thing allows for taking a thoughtful pseudo turn-based approach. A touch I particularly like is that at the end of each level you see a replay of how your performance looked in real time. Shame that they felt the need to cover the screen in garbage and mute the sound with the computer voice reading out the name of the game over and over again, like they programmed a robot with Paris Hilton's entire vocabulary. I wonder if the sheer spectacle of things is inherently lessened when, as with all first-person games, it feels like we're controlling a tall cardboard box balancing on a Roomba. But on the whole, it's a neat gameplay concept. I wouldn't say the game as a whole does it justice. You exclusively fight uniform untextured red mannequins in white rooms. It's like being in an advert for a stain remover that specialises in menstrual fluid. And what passes for a story is over in under two hours. There are challenge modes after that, but I've established to my satisfaction what a dying red figurine looks like, thanks. The aesthetic deliberately goes for the retro computer look, so the menus are all in ASC2, and there's added scan lines, bloom and curving at the edges to look like it's on a CRT monitor. A style that is just now veering over into being prevalent enough in indie games to start trying my patience. I didn't buy a flat screen TV to be constantly reminded of the obsolete shit it's supposed to have replaced indie gaming, that's what we elect new presidents for. The story is told partly through a fake instant messenger during which we are expected to pretend to type in order to make the protagonist's dialogue appear. There's something faintly pathetic about that. It's like the audience participation at the Christmas panto. We all know damn well the forthcoming events will not change whether we yell he's behind you or not, but you're going to hold everything up until we say it, aren't you, you fucking cross-dressing bitch? The plot is we play a big nerd sitting in front of a computer playing games. Whoa, slow down, Super Hog, give me a chance to get into character, who gets sent the hot new game by their online friend and the barriers between game and reality start to break down as a mysterious force within the game begins to mess with you, in a rather weak source and desperate manner. Ha ha, we're in control now, you cannot escape. Press escape and see what happens. Could I just play the next combat mission, please? Hit escape, you prick! Alright, fine. Ha ha ha, it didn't work! As cat with mouse, I toy with thee. Now I'm going to make you quit the game and restart it again. What now, bitch? I don't know, maybe I'll get some work done. Wait, come back! You're not as clever as you think you are, super hot. Undertale pulled off the quit and restart gag because it had earned it. Without that, it's just annoying. Meta narrative style fuckabouts is like the backstroke. If you start doing it before we're immersed, you just look like a twat. Whenever a new Tom Clancy game comes out, I always have to double check his Wikipedia page to make sure he's still dead. 
He's prolific for a corpse. Still, it explains a few things. You'd have to be pretty fucking brain dead to think The Division was any fun. Arf, arf, heyo, games journalism, etc. Division is a third person cover shooter set in a near future Manhattan where there was a total breakdown of law and order on Black Friday. No change there then. On this occasion, however, a terrorist released a weaponized virus and the resultant pandemic has reduced New York City to a post apocalyptic gang terrorized quarantine zone. Which, on the bright side, might finally bring down the average rent. We are a member of a secret government agency called The Division that consists of agents secretly inserted throughout the general population for no particular reason. Now being activated to go into ruined Manhattan and jolly well sort it out. Cause it turns out Wayne LaPierre was right all along. The only thing that can stop a bad roving pack of murderous thugs is a good roving pack of murderous thugs. So let me see if I've got this straight, the corpse of Tom Clancy. We're a member of the secret police under no official scrutiny or accountability, and our job is to go into an area of civil unrest and murder dissenting citizens without trial. And it's not set in Stalinist Russia. Now we can take these back to the people, said my earpiece friend after a supply recovering mission. Sorry, which people were those again? Presumably not the people in whose corpses I now stand knee deep. Oh right, you meant the real people, the ones that bowed and scraped when the government assassination squad showed up. See, the premise would have worked perfectly well if we'd just been some random citizen doing our bit to take back the city, Charles Bronson style, baby. The only thing the secret police thing adds is to make us less relatable and give hard-ons to the paranoid authoritarian lot who want to believe that the government will finally sort out those intimidating young people who stand around outside their house talking loudly. I wouldn't normally pick on it for the dodgy ethics, cause when it comes to modern shooters, and especially ones with Tom Clancy's corpse rot about them, that's like picking on a rhinoceros for being shit at kayaking. I'm only airing this out because the game's also pillow smotheringly dull. For a start, as well as being another Tom Clancy coffin belch, it's also a Ubisoft sandbox, and you know what that means these days? A big splattery face full of samey missions with a flimsy overarching plot as detached as the chocolate top from a badly made caramel slice, and all sense of progress is conveyed solely through incrementing numbers. It's very much the gameplay that Borderlands refers to as shoot and loot, and which I refer to as shit and piss. So you have to take five minutes after every mission to make sure you've equipped the most optimal knee pads, bunny ears, and nipple pasties. Oh, that reminds me, what is the fucking point of cosmetic? when every single outfit conveys the same overall look. You will never not look like a gap year backpacker got dragged through a climbing gear warehouse, but what specific fabric of murky orange parka and barely visible undershirt do you think best conveys your quirky individual personality? If you ask me, the overt RPG mechanics make the game even more frighteningly tone deaf. I mean, there are moments when certain characters beam down from Planet Sensible and call out the whole unaccountable secret police thing, and the game does present it like he's making a valid point, but then the cutscene ends and we go straight back to, oh boy, time to fight some level 20 disenfranchised citizens. Watch out for the elite enemies, they get more health from being extra disenfranchised. The tone's all over the place. One moment you find an audio log of someone using the mummified corpses of their children to get the campfire started, the next you're talking to one of those wacky section commanders who all have a single hilarious personality quirk, like they keep talking about their TV career or how they used to work at the zoo jerking off polar bears. It's a big fat indicator that the game had nine different writers who spent the whole dev cycle locked in different toilet cubicles. But just to repeat myself, they could have crafted all the dialogue by cutting lines out of old episodes of Masters of the Universe and it wouldn't have mattered so much if the core gameplay was fun. And it really, really, really isn't. Would you like to go to a place full of naughty men and shoot them all, or stay in one place and wait for naughty men to come to you and shoot them all? Don't worry, there'll be plenty of opportunities to figure out which one you prefer, and after each samey shootout, you can trudge down empty streets for five minutes having a really good hard think about it. Normally, I'd say that it's one of those bad sandboxes where the open world adds a little beyond a tedious between mission commute, but then I tried to imagine the game with the commute removed so it was nothing but the missions back to back, and concluded it probably wouldn't have improved matters after I woke up 12 hours later. Moving up and shooting the baddies trundles the gameplay along like a fridge on a tricycle before an elite enemy shows up and the game flow stops, lies down on its side and starts to gently dribble on the carpet. Fighting elites is an absolute chore. Their health bars are so massive they have to turn themselves sideways to fit through a standard doorway. I'd rack up ten headshots as they nonchalantly strolled towards my position and there'd be nothing to show for it but a slightly ruffled moustache. And if elite enemies are a chore, elite snipers are ten days chained to a sewing machine in Beijing. I swear they can get a bullet out before they've even finished standing up properly. So either they're cheating or the speed of light has gotten as tired of this bollocks as I am. Can I digress for a moment? Well, fuck you, I'm doing it anyway. I'm getting kind of sick of the style of visual interface wherein GUI text is presented as some kind of physical object in the world, appearing on top of and angled alongside the object it's indicating. Because it means I can't read the fucking things if my character's standing too close, and I'd have thought stay within my field of vision would have been the first thing a young text box learns at readability school after the location of the fire exits. Blimey, that was petty. But I have nothing more to add on the division because I stopped playing it halfway through. Maybe it comes alive at the end when you and the gang leaders compete in the big tap dance contest, but I'll never know and I don't care anymore. I can't remember the last time a game left me so paralysed with boredom. The remainder of the game stretched away in front of me like an endless swirling vortex that absorbed all joy and interest from its surroundings, so I tried to put on some music but Guns N' Roses just put their instruments down and had an earnest conversation about civil engineering. The Division gave me a priapism and a week-long bout of constipation. I was bored stiff and bored shitless. Remember how a while back I said we should stop using the phrase Dark Souls clone? Just like I once said we should stop saying Grand Theft Auto clone and then Sleeping Dogs came out and I had to say spoke too fucking soon. I've got nothing left if I can't call Soldan Sanctuary a Dark Souls 
Souls clone. If it put a banana on its head, I could call it that game that's got a banana on its head, but until that day, let's stick with Dark Souls clone. Games like Bloodborne and Lords of the Fallen are certainly Dark Souls-esque, but nothing less than clone feels adequate for Salt and Sanctuary, the only main difference being the poultry fact that it's a 2D platformer. That sounds like a pretty fucking significant difference to me, Yarty. Well, of course you'd think that voice in my head. You're obviously a technically minded sort, or you wouldn't keep trying to get me to buy knives. A third dimension does not a Dark Souls make. Dark Souls is in the tone, the muddy visuals, the grim futile atmosphere of an anxiety dream of a medieval knight with galloping syphilis. There are plenty of gameplay differences, and there's the fact that Dark Souls never had a super deformed character art style reminiscent of an edgy webcomic from the early 2000s, drawn by someone who wasn't very good at anatomy but considered it very important that there exist a picture of furry Jesus Christ trying to free his knob from a stillborn fetus, but despite all that there are moments when Salt and Sanctuary could almost be a direct 2D adaptation of Dark Souls, with the names changed into slightly shittier ones. Quick example, Blight Town was a good name for a ramshackle colony on a poisonous bog, Mire of Stench, not so much, because it's kind of redundant and immediately reminds me of that David Bowie film. Anyway, in Salt and Sanctuary you are drowning in semen. Oop, my mistake. In Salt and Sanctuary, you are a drowning seaman, who wakes up after the traditional impossible opening boss fight to find themselves on the shore of a mysterious haunted land consisting of fragments of dead civilizations crammed together like six piglets in a duffel bag, populated by the undead and the occasional top half of a person grafted onto something that isn't one of the very small number of things it is appropriate for the top half of a person to be grafted onto. You set off to find the princess you were supposed to be escorting, but the game puts very little effort into pretending that that is the actual plot, so we set off to explore the open-ended landscape and gather salt from our enemies, which is different to souls, because you can't put souls on your chips, but otherwise it's just as useful for upgrading your character at bonfires. Whoops, I mean sanctuaries. When you die, you lose all your salt, which is a bit counterintuitive because getting killed makes me pretty fucking salty, and also a percentage of your money. Ah, there's something different. In Dark Souls, you charge everything to your souls account, whereas in Salt and Sanctuary, money and salt are separate things. I'm not sure why, though, because the only things money can buy are low-level items that stop being useful about 30 seconds into the game, and you do all your weapon upgrading with salt and with specific items of vendor trash that dying enemies puke out like reverse vacuum cleaners. So every time I died and the game waggled its finger informing me that it was taking a percentage of my cash, I'd be all like, oh no, please don't. I hate having to manually pull my trousers down. Another difference is that you can populate sanctuaries with NPC vendors and must decide if it's worth giving up a precious blacksmith token to be able to get your sword upgraded at the summits of Mount's bumfuck. Except there's also a vendor who lets you teleport between sanctuaries, so just put one of those in as many places as you can and stick all the other vendors in one or two of the nice sanctuaries with the affordable beachfront real estate. Now, you understand I'm not complaining that a game is reminiscent of Dark Souls because me and Dark Souls is like your mum and pies, but certain important things are lost in the shift to 2D. For example, Salt and Sanctuary could really do with a fuck map. Dark Souls can't have one because there's too much verticality, but it also doesn't really need one because it's got the scenery porn thing. Better look around and figure out where I am. Oh, I remember now, I'm in a fantasy nightmare world, and I'm making my way towards that vast brick phallus in the distance. Gosh, can't wait to find out how many things want to murder me there. You don't have that in 2D. In 2D what you've got is, gosh, I can't wait to see what's past this 20 feet of stairway I'm currently looking at. In Dark Souls, whenever I walked to an old bonfire, I never had to wander about a few minutes trying to remember where the fuck I was in relation to everywhere else. So map, please. You don't have to be a pushover about it, make it kind of abstract or fire scorpions at my mouth every time I look at it. Combat obviously loses some complexity in 2D, but Salty Sancho admirably recreates the most important characteristics of Souls combat, by which I mean dodge rolling behind people as they attack always works, and the hitboxes are absolutely fucked. Where the combat rubs up against the border between Dark Souls Town and Symphony of the Nightville is when you get hit by a heavy attack and your character goes flying gaily across the screen like a happy little tear gas canister at a protest against police brutality, which wasn't that annoying in Symphony of the Night because there was no fall damage, but guess what there's gobs of in Salty Sancho along with a platforming emphasis that means you're never more than ten steps from a death drop. Again, kind of like your mum and pies. Of all the many times that I died in this game, about 60% of them were from being knocked off a ledge, and 30% were from failing to grab a ledge because the PS4 analog sticks misbehaved. But Salty Sancho's flinging fuckery was also its downfall because the final boss somehow managed to clip me into a wall in such a way that it couldn't hit me, but I could hit him, because I was using a greatsword about half the length of my dick. I then beat him with ease, thinking to myself, well, I was probably just about to win anyway. And that, people, is how easy it is to fall to the dark side. Mind you, some of the flying bosses fucked me up by initiating their attacks from off-screen, so I guess we can call it even on the naughty cheating front, Salty Sancho. On the whole, I seem to remember enjoying my time with Saltine Crackers, but then I've never been the same since the stroke. As you may have noticed, I have trouble moving past the Dark Souls comparison, so it's possibly struggling to find an identity. The cartoony art style is pretty appropriate since the game as a whole feels like a big-headed, chibi version of Dark Souls, Marlon Brando midget style, with its smaller, kinda samey environments and more frequent boss fights that make it feel thinly spread. I don't know how much of my absorption came from the game itself and how much came from it reminding me of my happy place. But who gives a shit? It's Dark Souls with Symphony of the Night plugged into the gaps and I like both games. So I'm having a blowjob while snacking on fun-sized Mars bars. 
It seems that episodic games are just something we're going to have to learn to live with now, like climate change and the unskippable advert odds are good you just had to endure. I'm resolved to try to stop reviewing new ones based on their first episodes just because I'm unwilling to wait months on end before I start belittling them. I mean, who knows where King's Quest is at this point? Maybe it's moved on to ripping off all kinds of films other than The Princess Bride. And much as I'd like to discuss the first episode of Hitman, and the fun to be had trying to furtively drag a naked pool boy into the toilet stall before a guard can show up and completely spoil the romance, I'm the kind of guy who likes to immerse myself in a game for 20 hours until either it breaks or my catheter does, so giving my impressions at this stage would be like filling out my massage therapist's customer satisfaction survey before I've even had my happy ending. So let's belittle an episodic game that actually finished recently, Republic. And having gone through the whole saga that took months if not years of build-up to reach a conclusion, I can authoritatively declare it a resounding eh. But then what can one expect of a game that can't even spell Republic properly? In Republic, we play as ourselves, using our aging gaming computers to hack into the network of a sinister facility which we view exclusively through closed-circuit surveillance and phone cameras, an immersive and innovative narrative device that brings back happy memories of Night Trap on the Sega CD. And just to continue the comparison, your job is to spy on girls and make sure they don't get grabbed by creepy dudes in black. Well, a girl named Hope, as in I hope I don't get molested by creepy dudes in black today. Hope contacts us with her face a little unsettlingly close to the phone camera so we can get a really good look at how many corners were cut in the eyelids animation department, and begs us to help her escape from an oppressive regime where she is due to be mind wiped for reading some state censored dirty books or something. As we guide Hope through what everyone keeps referring to as a totalitarian nation but which looks to me more like a single facility with about 30 rooms, we piece together the full story of the place, the individuals involved, and their sinister plan to imprison teenage girls and spy on them reading dirty books, which is not as self-explanatory as it sounds. It's an all-star voice cast, David Hayter, Jennifer Hale, Dwight Schultz plays the villain, there's no one quite like Dwight Schultz for playing characters who seem like they could sorely use a good hard cock up their arse. Characterization's really rather strong, even the monsters have a touch of humanity about them, in many ways the most human are the most monstrous of them all. There was a point in Ripi Blunk when I realised I was into it, and that was the ending of the third episode. Hope realises she unknowingly betrayed a friend as she receives her first glimpse of an outside world and there's this powerful mix of emotions that overwhelms her, and that got me. I was in then. Sadly, I was out again by the time I got to the very end. Out, then in, then out, then nary a chance to shake it all about. See, before the third episode, the gameplay had been getting tiresome. The stealth action part of the promised stealth action adventure involves clicking on a bit of wall to make Hope go to it, then clicking it a few more times till she realises she's supposed to use it for cover, the silly moo. Then you use the cameras to scout ahead and make sure her path is clear of guard patrols. I've spoken to people who said they don't like stealth gameplay because it's boring. It's sitting in a hole with a thumb up your butt, waiting for a guard to turn around. Where's the big cock to distract me from contemplating my empty existence. Obviously, I burned them to death, but dash it if repube like didn't remind me of that argument. Cause the guards amble along their predictable patrols like a slug trying to decide what videos to rent out, dated simile. Then you can buy some special powers that make their routes even more predictable and the slugging even more sluggish. There are tasers and pepper spray lying around everywhere on the off chance they spot you. And even if you run out, they just take you to a cell in the next room and leave the door unlocked. Bending over backwards to not leave the crap outs behind, it's like a wrestler having to pretend to lose to a cancer kid for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. But then episode three had that ending and a puzzle involving gathering dirt on guards to get them away from a door that I thought was kind of neat. Even if the same result could have been gotten by just pulling a fire alarm, but that's adventure games for you. Alright, colour me intrigued, Repoblark. What's next? I'm glad you asked. Here's a fourth episode where basically nothing happens, and a final one in which about 19 different things get tied up in a very small space. Oh dear, colour me out intrigued again. And then colour yourself with the puke green taint of failure. Honestly, I didn't get what was going on by the end, and it seemed like events were coming out of nowhere. That's probably because a full understanding of the plot hinges on patiently listening to the approximately 9 hundred billion hours of audio logs, a lot of which can be missed. One particular set of audio logs is on cassette tapes that you can't listen to unless you find a stereo. It's like your dad making you find the stick he's gonna beat you with. I'm not gonna stop playing for half an hour to awkwardly stand by the stereo like a giraffe on an ice rink, feeding it tape after tape. I've got a lot of small walls I need to crouch behind. Call me an overstimulated millennial, but I prefer an audio log that you can have running over gameplay. If we're sitting waiting for patrols with thumb up butt, it gives us something to listen to. There is a possibility they'll get drowned out if something interesting happens, with any luck. One rather mystifying collectible side quest involves collecting floppy disks bearing the logos of popular indie darlings like Shovel Knight and Gunpoint, and the inevitable attached audio logs consist of a character gushing about them. Seems a bit counterproductive to pause your game to tell the audience all about another game they could probably be having a better time with right now, but perhaps there's more behind this. Gaze at the Steam Store page for a Ponklong, and you'll find it makes a special point of mentioning that it was made by industry veterans who worked on AAA titles, like Metal Gear Solid and Halo. Now if you decide that as a sensible person would that the AAA industry is about due to suffocate to death on its own farts, and that it was time to flee the sinking ship stroke farting bottom, as seek refuge in the more creatively rewarding sphere of core indie games, perhaps you'd see the value in trying to ingratiate yourself with your new chosen clique. In practice, however, it evokes the one desperate dweeb at high school who hangs around the cool kids. Hey kid, jerk us all off. Can do! Does this mean we're friends? Not until you eat this ladybird. So I guess my advice is, play as far as the third episode and then lower your expectations into a shallow grave in the woods.
Everything's ready for Dark Souls 3. I've erected a new wall to bang my head against and refresh my stash of chewing bricks. All I have to do now is sit here wearing these hype deflecting blinkers for about two more weeks and distract myself by attaching a honey badger to my bollocks. But the union says the honey badger has to have a lunch break every eight hours, so while it's away I might as well pass the time with a game that's a couple of years old now, but has been on my catch-ups list for precisely a moment such as this. Shadow Warrior. Not to be confused with Shadow Man, A Shadow's Tail, Shadows of the Damned, Shadow of the Beast, or Shawaddy Waddy, nor indeed to be confused with a Shadow Warrior that it is a remake of. A late 90s build engine shooter from the Duke Nukem mold, and you know what that means violence, endemic key hunting, and a questionable attitude towards women. But in this case, also with more than a spicy hint of casual racism. I ain't no Tumblr tot getting my pronouns in a twist over cultural appropriation, but when a bloke with a comedy English accent runs around with a samurai sword screaming about how his name means penis, you've gotta wonder how it would fly at a summit of the United Nations. So the remake takes quite a few liberties with the plot of the original. I'm not entirely certain the original had a plot. The only thing I remember clearly from it is a naked anime babe doing a great big farty dump. Our protagonist, Lo Wang, is remodeled as a quipping, egotistical, bungling badass with an only slightly less silly accent, and so brings to mind the comedy Asian bloke from the Hangover movies being cast to understudy Bruce Campbell in Army of Darkness. He's sent by a shady boss type man to acquire a magic sword from some other gang leader type, but Wang doesn't have a name that means cock for nothing, and soon acquire has turned into steal, kill everyone, burn house down. However, the world is soon hit by an invasion of genocidal demons, and it becomes clear that there are darker forces than the shady boss man with an interest in the niceties of magic sword ownership rights, and Wang sets out to finish the job and get the sword to his master. Somewhere along the way this turns into kill his master and eventually kill the lords of Demon Town as well, and I'm not entirely certain where the changes happened. See, the recurring issue I had with the plot is that the game seems to think Wang is undergoing a character arc, and speaking as the guy who spent eight hours inhabiting his skull, I beg to differ. By the very end, it's making out like he's finally become a noble warrior hero, but no transformation was in evidence around the end of the previous episode, but one, in which he blew up a ship while his allies were still on it for basically no reason, although it's refreshing to be on the other side of a stock totally illogical betrayal for once. So, Shadow Warrior is a first-person shooter that got recommended to me as like Painkiller but with a plot, which isn't a great recommendation because there's pretty much everything with the Painkiller brand on it beyond the first one demonstrates, trying for any plot more complex than you man kill demons grunt grunt fire hot, more often than not is the metaphorical handful of sand in the fleshlight, but Shadow Warrior does indeed boast fast-paced arena horde fights that would be reminiscent of Painkiller if Painkiller had had maybe one-tenth of the monster variety. There's a bit of a focus on melee sword attacks, which has the usual issue that close combat in first person has, best demonstrated by strapping a GoPro to the head of an excited dog in a room full of unshredded tissue paper and trying to follow what's going on. This is compensated effectively for by being able to propel yourself around the battlefield with powerful rocket farts, and your special sword attacks can be a pretty effective last word, the word being argle spurt spurt thump. It's just weird how you have to pull them off with Street Fighter combos. Tap forward twice then hold attack for the lunge. Is there any particular reason it couldn't have been tap forward once then hold attack? And that's still a bit much to spontaneously lever into the middle of a fast paced monster fight when I've already had one bum cheek bitten off. Mind you, it seems we've got plenty of bum cheeks to spare because I only died like once in my entire playthrough and that was from falling three feet into a place I wasn't supposed to be in. The health kit fairy has thrown herself into her work to get over a bad breakup and on top of that you have the power to clench your asshole and get a bunch of health back whenever you want. I think Shadow Warrior suffers from a bit of the too many upgrades syndrome. You buy magic upgrades with special gems, skills with XP, and gun upgrades with good old fashioned money, and almost none of them evolve the gameplay in any way. It's all shit like do 10% more damage to lower demons. What the fuck constitutes a lower demon, Charlie? You mean the less respectable ones, or the ones that are under 5 foot? There's also a combat rating system where you get stars out of 5 based on something. I never figured out what it wanted from me. Nuke the whole battlefield with rockets, 1 star. Make an effort to use every weapon, every spell, and kill at least one guy by tweaking his nipples, 1.5 stars. Turret section where I take down the fire button and zoned out for a minute. Four stars, great job. Wouldn't it be funny to have a game that claimed to be rating combat skill but was actually throwing out random numbers? That'd infuriate the perfectionist lot, wouldn't it? And I'm not saying Shadow Warrior has done that, just that if it did, I probably wouldn't notice the difference. So despite not being based around praying on your knees at the chest high ultra to the god of cover shooting, the combat's nonetheless clunky. Probably too many weapons. I never really figured out how the heart worked, and the flamethrower is as much use as blowing raspberries at a cigarette lighter. Also, not a fan of the level design. I can tell the game's over long, because it's working its limited art assets till you could get a cricket bat down their bum holes without touching the sides, take a drink every time you see an arcade cabinet. One of the characteristics of the old Duke Nukem 3D style shooter and its peers was that each map was a distinct location. Level 1, the train station. Level 2, the shopping mall. Level 3, the domestic violence shelter. Meanwhile, the entire first episode of Shadow Warrior consists of about 500 copies of the same house that all for some reason have the same Ikea cabinets. Secret hunting was also a big thing in the original Shadow Warrior, but if you're gonna bring that back, maybe don't discourage exploration by putting invisible walls all over the place, especially on objects that even Professor Stephen Hawking could have jumped on top of. You know what, now that I've written all this down, I don't think Shadow Warrior was much good. Occasionally decent combat and dialogue, blighted by over-designed, dull levels and poor plotting. Still, a must-play for people who like games where the main character's name means penis. Once you're finished with Solid Snake and Jet Set Willy, every foreskin fumigating time I have to play an Xbone game, that dusty rectangular turd has to make an adventure of it. I thought I'd get clever this time and put the disc in a few hours before I intended to play it, only to switch to the Xbone after lunch and find it saying, disc doesn't ring a bell, take out, put back in, oh that disc, suppose I better install it then, 1%, 2%, 47%, phew that was tiring, think I'll stay at 47% for the next three 
three hours. I still can't think that the concept of an exclusive game can possibly be long for this world of competitive big money entertainment. Here's a game that costs us millions of dollars to make. Let's restrict its potential audience and handcuff it to an incontinent elephant seal for literally no reason except that the elephant seal says we can ride around on it if we take our shoes off. But anyway, Quantum Break is an exclusive title for X-Bone and Elephant Seal that comes to us from Remedy, the creators of Alan Wake. Alan Wake then Quantum Break? Are you guys writing a fucking limerick? Quantum Break is a fluffy wuppy contemporary sci-fi yarn about time travelling digitised actors. Our hero is Jack Joyce, fat-faced everyman, who returns to his hometown to assist an old friend with a time travel experiment, despite having the scientific background of a plate of pork chops. But nobody relates to scientists, why do you think Marty McFly had to do all the legwork? Naturally, something buggers up, Jack's mate disappears, reappears 17 years older and evil, and Jack gets time-based superpowers which he has about 24 hours to play around with before the universe explodes. On the run from his former friend's new evil mega corporation, Jack must overcome a rapidly splintering universe and his own big, fat, stupid, stupid head to find a solution. The villain is played by Aiden Littlefinger, who plays him very well, except for the pre-villain phase of the character, because he constantly comes across like he's waiting for the chance to lick the back of your head. He really is the actor for whom the word snake-like was invented. He certainly uses his tongue like a snake. He sticks that thing out so much it should have its own IMDb page. Maybe his tongue in particular makes me unsettled, because I remember all the shit it got up to in Queer as Folk, and I chose the words of that sentence very carefully. What I haven't mentioned yet is that Quantum Break is a revolutionary hybrid of video game and live-action TV show, meaning that between every gameplay chapter you're obliged to watch a 20-minute video of the internal politics of the evil megacorporation, which seems to involve an awful lot of punching security guards and running very urgently down corridors. Now I'm not one to piss in something just for trying to be different, hell my kitchen sink is the same every day and I still piss in that, but having already restricted the audience to expo owners, i.e. Pillux, we're now pairing it down further into the Venn diagram overlap region of Pillux who equally enjoy video games and TV shows. Well I suppose if you're just into games you can always skip the video bits, as long as you also overlap with Pillux who like not having a clue what's going on, and games that are over in five hours. Serious question Remedy, are you sure you wouldn't be happier making TV shows? You've clearly got a fondness for sticking video content in your games, usually on passing TV screens up until now, and American TV networks do seem to greenlight shit like what you make at a rate that must be measured in nanoseconds. I ask, because it feels like every time a gameplay section starts you can almost hear the game heaving a reluctant sigh. Time manipulation in action games is nothing new, bullet time has been with us for ages, which Remedy should know because they invented it, but very few of Jack's time powers are actually time related in any practical sense. What are you talking about, barks the game? You've got your time stun, your time dash, your time shield, they've got time right there in the name, what more do you want? Time shield? It just stops bullets, it's a Mario star in a pretentious haircut. Look, this is my time handkerchief, woo, it uses the uncanny power of the fourth dimension to stop flying bogeys and occasionally spunk. There's something terribly token about the combat gameplay, you only need to look at the upgrade screen to get that impression. A grand total of three upgrades per power and most of them are make effects last slightly longer. At other times gameplay consists of very singularity-esque environmental puzzles where the solution is always press contextual time power button to remove obstacle. Look, if you want to base your game around linear story then more power to you, or perhaps I should say more time to you since time is power, as the slightly baffling tagline tells us. God knows linear story focus is becoming a rarity in AAA gaming these days where all anyone seems to want are sandboxes and chrome-plated hamster wheels, but you do have to at least acknowledge the whole interactive part of interactive storytelling, or you might as well just make TV shows. Very much like Alan Wake, when the game isn't trundling out another room full of knob jockeys for you to punish, you go through linear narrative areas in which it becomes extremely clear what sort of player the game would prefer to have, the kind that is content to walk slowly alongside NPCs as the NPCs tortuously deliberate on when to open the door to the next room, and who meekly sit with head bowed and hands clasped waiting for the current dialogue to end before proceeding. And if you don't want to play like you're trying to wing it through a puppet show you don't have the script for, then things swiftly go awry. For example, I'd enter a large area and start exploring it for collectibles and upgrade tokens for my token upgrades, but the game attempts to continue the conversation I was having with an NPC even after I move out of earshot, so I find myself making random witty rejoinders to the crate I am trying vainly to climb on top of. I turn on a radio, listen to the DJ for a bit, get bored and keep exploring the room, find a document that Jack comments upon, accidentally activate the TV that plays a five minute video, then the NPC starts nagging me to come over and press the continue plot button. Four dialogues now layer over each other, it's like my brain is trying to simultaneously pat its head, rub its tummy and read aloud a passage from Ulysses. Quantum Break wants to be judged on its story, fine, it's okay. Jack Joy starts to annoy when he still hasn't accepted that history can't be changed, even after I, every single NPC and Hitler's dead dog have figured it out. But on the whole the story was well told, and I know it was because I still basically understood it by the end, which is more than I can say for Alan Wake. It's at the points where story intersects with action game that we find buttons pushed through the wrong holes and bell ends caught in zippers. Doing a live action companion series on the side might have been a better idea than putting them together in the same space. Switching between live action and 3D rendering can be a bit jarring as the characters toboggan gaily down the walls of the uncanny valley. Oh no, the time fracture has gotten worse! Every single person on Earth has had a stroke! Let me say right out of the gate that you can call me Billy Blue Biased Bollocks on this one. If you're looking for a fresh perspective on Dark Souls, you can hop off to Jimmy Neutral the Sexless Gamer's YouTube channel so he can whine about getting murdered with knives over and over again as he scratches the disappointing little nubs that one day, God willing, will become his balls. I haven't got the slightest idea what Dark Souls 3 would be like for a newcomer to the series. I imagine it'd be like meeting your girlfriend's family in Newcastle. You get talked out like you're supposed to know what they're
there on about for an hour and then get brutally killed with sticks. But Dark Souls is my comfort zone, it's the big squishy armchair full of lost pocket change and razor wire that I can always settle into whenever I'm bored, stressed out, coming down from a bad trip, or being held captive by Syrian revolutionaries. Actually, it came in handy that time because the Syrian revolutionaries had been having a terrible time with the Hydra until I showed them where to get the rusted iron ring. The point is, this is all coming from a fan, so expect me to complain about how formulaic it's gotten while simultaneously bitching about everything that's different. Dark Souls wouldn't be Dark Souls if it wasn't as open and transparent with its story as a cocaine dealer in a police interview room, so let me provide a little cheat sheet here. The world of Dark Souls is caught in an endless cycle of fire and dark, and each game takes place in the final days of a dwindling age of fire. Someone must either link the fire to postpone the inevitable, or just toss it all in and get a dark age going. Sort of like the choice between a Clinton and Trump presidency. In Dark Souls 3, however, all the lads whose job it was to oversee the linking process have buggered off to a man, having perhaps reached the reasonable conclusion that we're three games in now and the whole Age of Fire, Age of Dark thing doesn't seem to be working out. Maybe it's time to hang the stupid business and try an Age of Spiders or an Age of Meringue. Consequently, people like you have risen from their graves as unkindled, to jolly well talk some sharp pointy sense into them. Being unkindled is not quite the same as being undead as you were in the last two games. Firstly, you use embers rather than humanity to get out of a diminished condition after death, and secondly, that's it. So the game can witter on about how the stakes have totally been raised because you're called something different and you spend the game descending from the final castle area rather than ascending towards it, but the fundamentals are all in their usual places. It's Dark Souls, you explore themed areas in states of advanced decrepitude, chew on a boss fight or two, then move on to the next. First impressions were good though, Dark Souls 1 provided a nice balance of the two major food groups, dudes in armour and fucked up monsters with hammerhead sharks instead of toenails, and I talked shit about Dark Souls 2 for getting kinda tubby on the generic dudes in armour diet, so when Dark Souls 3's introductory boss fight was against generic dude in armour number 8047, I was lured into a state of eye-rolling resignation that swiftly ended after I got him down to half health and a giant black monster bogey the size of a minibus burst out of his nostrils and slapped me about like I was a stress ball and it had gone three months without masturbating. That rather sets the tone for what will probably turn out to be Dark Souls' final instalment in which the decrepitude is decrepting it up even more than usual, the enemies rife with physical corruption and body horror. Kinda like the visual theme Bloodborne was going for, and incidentally isn't it impressive how From Software can trot out these massive open world games with such suspicious frequency. I ain't judging, I've been using the same imp graphic for eight years, but I do get a sense that Dark Souls is repeating itself quite a bit. Yes, like everyone else, when Sigmire showed up I had a happy little trouser accident, but only until I thought about it. As we all should know by now, a good sequel jumps off from the original, a bad sequel wallows in it. Dark Souls 2 jumped off, now Dark Souls 3 has jumped right back on again, tunnelled back into Dark Souls 1 and gone to sleep. It's like they ran out of new stuff at some point and filled in the gaps by carving off some chunks from the great big ball of Dark Souls and Bloodborne that now floats around the office occasionally commanding them to kill. Here comes a statement that will nail the end of my willy to the mast for all to come and pluck like a banjo string. I prefer Dark Souls 2's level design. I think it had more creativity. There is such a thing as too many cathedrals, Dark Souls 3. Are the undead hordes known for holding a lot of royal weddings? Another thing I found weirdly irritating was that I could just could not find any weapon that was better than my starting longsword. I don't comb every rancid bum crack of these games for the sake of my cardio. I'm looking for better items and equipment so I can piece by piece replace myself with Dark Fantasy Robocop. And I was doing my best to get into the spirit of things. By the end I had a bottom drawer full of upgraded boss weapons I'd used for all of five minutes each. Oh boy, this giant demonic axe that looks like a KFC zinger patty tied to the end of a whale's knob sure looks like the business, and then I'd take it out for a spin and discover that it was indeed the business as long as the enemies are polite enough to not stab you 19 times while they're waiting for your character to go through all 12 steps on the mandatory pre-swing checklist. Turns out some cues have been taken from Bloodborne's combat style where being able to hit faster is more important, and a lot of enemies can only wave back and forth in stunlock like an arthritic belly dancer while I dick slap them left and right with my whippy little longsword, appropriately upgraded with the titanite that the game showers you with like it's being plumbed through the hot taps. Oh yeah, there's a magic meter now, that's a new thing. So now you can actually cast Soul Spear more than three times before needing a lie down and a Gatorade, but it's telling that the manner in which this bold and unique franchise has chosen to innovate is to do a thing that every other RPG does. Frankly, I'm lukewarm on Dark Souls 3, which is ironic for a game that's mostly about setting yourself on fire. My first run didn't seem to take as long as in previous games, and the final boss was squitted out like an early morning fart, but then that's practically traditional at this point. And after the usual trip to the wiki to populate the traditional laundry list of shit I missed, because if you need everything to be signposted then you can sod off back to Google Street View. It turned out I'd missed quite a few things, so maybe I'll feel different after I've had a chance to play it to death, which I will inevitably do, because it's Dark Souls, and I will take whatever I can get in every slack unlubricated hole, but I'm given to understand that From Software are declaring this the last one, and that's certainly what it feels like, the last weary sigh before it lays its head down for a well-deserved sleep, followed by an idle midnight wank when the DLC comes out. You know, Yahtzee, I don't think you've ever given the new console generation a fair chance. What do you mean? When I get together with the x and the piss poor and rhythmically smash their heads together while screaming, why are you holding us all back, you bastards, you bastards, you bastards, they could change my mind in an instant. All they have to do is explode and stop blighting the universe with their presence. It's always been the lack of backwards compatibility and the utterly callous disregard for gaming history that gobs in my porridge. It's like they burnt the house down for the insurance money and then spent it all on an overpriced chrome refrigerator to live in instead. And it leads to 
to awkward situations like the one Insomniac Games found themselves in. With a movie of their long-running Ratchet & Clank series in the wings, they must have jolted awake one morning and gone, ah, all the games were exclusive for PS2 and PS3. So all our new fans who come in from the movie with shining eyes and fat wallets can't buy any of the fucking things without a time-traveling pirate ship. We'd better slap something together for the PS4, sharpish. Which was quite an impressively long statement for every single member of a dev studio to make in unison. So now we have the inevitable reboot with same name, Ratchet & Clank. And this is new ground for me. The series has passed me by up to now because I'm not a nickel baby boo-boo who wants to play games about fuzzy animal characters with a permanent case of DreamWorks eyebrow. I didn't even know there was a film coming out till the game discreetly mentioned it, immediately, at full volume, and then twice more on the box blurb. But the same box blurb promises that the game is equally enchanting for both fans and newcomers to the series, so that's alright then. Ratchet & Clank is representative of the ever unspecific action-adventure genre, a cartoon sci-fi knockabout that's like the fifth element had a baby with bookio hair after spending a little bit too much time hanging around dodgy internet communities. An evil organisation plots to unleash an army of killbots on the galaxy, but a reject killbot, that's Clank, escapes and crash lands in the back garden of a fuzzy and highly marketable wannabe space hero. That's Ratchet. Ratchet agrees to fly Clank to the big city planet so he can warn them about the incoming invasion. And by the time they get there, the invasion's already started, so so much for that. Note that this leaves Ratchet and Clank with precisely zero purpose or particular reason to stay together. I've had longer taxi rides and didn't end up forming lifelong partnerships with the driver, and I suppose this is the inherent problem with an attempt to swiftly re-establish the canon of the previous 47 games in one go, that we seem to be skipping quite a few steps. The bond between the two leads is treated as something automatic and preordained, not least of which by the fucking title of the game, rather than developing naturally over time. I'm willing to bet that that was more the case in the original Ratchet and Clamp because people liked that game, and we would not now be getting a film if people hadn't liked it. Thus is exposed the inherent paradox of this reboot. Explain to me the logic of a reboot attempting to bank on nostalgia for the very games it is attempting to erase from canon. It constantly references the old series, there's even a side quest around collecting trading cards of characters and weapons from previous games, so essentially the game is saying, hey, remember how much better we did this the first time around? Good, now forget all about it. Speaking as a newcomer, without the context of the established canon, Ratchet's a boring little shit. The term Mary Sue comes to mind like the face of an irritating relative. The perceived need to hurry the plot along means that he's barely got his trousers on before he's getting hailed as a galactic hero and everyone wants to be his friend, except for the one guy who betrays him for literally no reason, except that he's jealous of how totally bloody great he is. I really got a sense that the character was facing adversity. There's one scene after the villains blow up a planet where Ratchet immediately runs home blubbing because he failed one fucking thing in his glittering three hour career, and that lasts for all of a 15 second cutscene before he gets back in the saddle. Incidentally, after the planet explodes, there's a rather hasty line of dialogue to the effect, lucky the entire planet was evacuated in the 14 minutes of advance notice we were given, which screams last minute change to me. What made you chicken out of depicting implied genocide, lads? Were you afraid the kiddiewinks would be influenced into building planetary death ray cannons? So about that gameplay, it's third person action adventure with a little bit of everything, bit of combat, bit of platforming, bit of puzzles, a surprisingly faithful callback to the era of the original game in the PS2. Still to my mind the high watermark for consoles and may my nadgers get slammed in a car door if tisn't so. It made me slightly nostalgic for games like Psychonauts and every single 3D game Rare ever made. What really surprised me was how difficult the game could get. Have we become so softened by the ongoing blandification of AAA games that smash the autosave button like it's a virgin bumhole in a prison shower that we can be thrown by perfectly straightforward combat mechanics? I really start to miss the concept of dodge rolling when I see an enemy bullet closing in and my best defence is hoping that I'm already moving out of the way. Mind you, there are some things that stopped being prevalent for a reason, such as interrupting your shooty platform over a difficult five minute laser directing puzzle that brings the pace to a screeching halt. Thankfully there's the option to skip those, but not without admonishment. Are you sure you'll never get the achievement and gain true fulfilment in life? Weapon variety is the big selling point, and varied they certainly are if leaning a bit too hard on the wacky humour, like the gun that rather inefficiently turns enemies into sheep that just doesn't have the lasting humour value of that gun in Painkiller that pins enemies to walls and makes all their arms and legs fall off. I don't like how weapons level up with use, because it results in the scenario wherein after working long and hard to max out a weapon suddenly you don't want to use it anymore, because you don't want to waste the experience when your butane powered dog shit cannon doesn't yet have the diarrhoea bonus. All in all though, there are certainly worse distractions on the road to the grave, but the quality of Ratchet & Clank in itself is almost made meaningless by the circumstances surrounding it. If you were already a fan, then I'm all but certain you'll have played better ones, and if you weren't, and you do like the game, then where do you go from there? Gosh, I'd quite like to play the rest of the series now. Well you can't, hardy ha ha, film coming to cinema near you. So working our way back to where we already were before you fucked it all up is what you call progress, is it consoles? No, it's what we call let's buy another yacht. Nintendo, you're making this way too fucking easy for me. What should we go with, Star Fox Zero Interest? Star Fox Zero Gameplay? Ooh, Star Fox Zero Punctuation, that's the thing we're currently doing, isn't it? Nintendo have done it again! Oops, sorry, wrong emphasis. Nintendo have done it again. They've made one of their layabout children who hasn't worked in decades come up from the basement and sit at the dinner table with their new stepfather hardware gimmicks, whom Nintendo hastily married in a Vegas shotgun wedding during a time when they were feeling low and vulnerable. Perhaps Nintendo still imagines that they can find some happy middle ground where both the hardcore retro fans and the casual motion control twat badges can all play together in harmony. Blissful, highly lucrative harmony. Unfortunately, Nintendo are fucking kidding themselves if they think they can please everyone at once. You can 
try, but you'll just end up with very sore wrists and a very dry face. But we get ahead of ourselves. Star Fox Zero is a reboot of a franchise that hasn't shown its face in over ten years, in which science fiction space battles are enacted by characters in theme park mascot costumes who inspire varying degrees of irritation. Sort of like the logical place George Lucas would have taken Star Wars to if he hadn't been given the restraining order. You are Fox McCloud, fearless cardboard cutout protagonist type, and only Fox in the rather narcissistically named Star Fox Squadron, which also consists of a frog, a rabbit, and a bird, presumably in case Fox gets hungry during a long space mission, because he certainly doesn't keep them around for their combat skill. They're out to save the universe from the evil armies of a giant monkey from another dimension, for you see, all great science fiction has at heart a relevant contemporary message. In this case, make sure not to run out of tasty bananas. The game is an arcade space shooter with the emphasis on arcade. Some of the levels are on rails, demanding that you dodge incoming obstacles while not knowing what direction the rails are going to move in, so that's an adventure in blunt force trauma to the face. And some of them are free roam, to use the phrase generously, as the free roam area is about the size of a cruise ship ensuite bathroom. And you'll only know that you've flown out of bounds when the game wrestles control from you and makes you U-turn directly into the missile you were trying to escape from. So about those motion controls, just to bring us back to the subject of sore wrists, aim your lasers by tilting the screen controller, went to the game's tutorial. Press the target button to- hey, what the fuck are you doing in the options menu? Did you really think you could turn off the tilting controls? I'm afraid we're trapped in this hell together, matey. Sorry for one blindly optimistic moment, I thought Nintendo might have realised that insisting on a single control scheme is unhelpful in our wonderful world of all kinds of people with varied preferences and levels of flexibility. Can I at least adjust the sensitivity? As my elbows are still sore from stabbing a policeman to death and I prefer not to have to make large movements. No you can't, you uppity sod. Here's your options. You can turn on a thing that makes the aiming control somehow even worse, or you can soak up your little vagina spillage and come and join us in the real world. Now here's how the fucking targeting controls work. Um, sorry to be picky again, but do you have any other targeting systems available? Like say for example one that fucking helps? One that could maybe target the enemy ship that's closest or that my aiming reticle is pointing at, rather than the one wearing the prettiest dress? Just when I think the Wii U might have finally accepted that human beings aren't going to evolve chameleon eyes that can independently swivel anytime soon, we have a game that tries to make the screen controller and the TV work together. The screen controller is the cockpit view, which has the peripheral vision of a one-eyed horse on a subway train, and the TV has the third-person camera, so you have to use the TV to find the thing to shoot at, and the controller to actually aim at the thing. And what bothers me is that there really doesn't seem to be a reason for it except to invent a purpose for the hardware gimmick. It's like the game really, really wanted to justify its purchase of a seeing-eye dog, so it gouged its own eyes out. Going back and forth between the screen and a much smaller, shittier one, covered in dusty finger marks and blood, is annoying enough even when you're not expected to do it throughout a pitched high-octane laser battle. But even if you do get bitten by a radioactive switchboard operator and the controls become halfway decent, the learning process is severely hampered by the constant switching of gameplay style and vehicles throughout the campaign, all of which have shitty controls in subtly different ways. You can almost justify using the screen controller to aim from a spaceship, because moving and aiming in three-dimensional space is a pretty complicated business, it turns out, but not from a tank. There's a perfectly good right analogue stick I could be using to aim with, but the game would prefer I use that to make the tank perform gymnastics. Of course, there's plenty besides the controls to pick on, the controls would have been entirely moot if my cartoon-voiced sidekicks had made just one more unhelpful comment, because I wouldn't have been able to reach my controller after I'd shoved it up their ass. And I should mention that when the campaign proper began and I saw the map of 809 planets representing upcoming levels, I assumed that this was World 1, Super Mario 3 style. Imagine my surprise to discover that this was in fact the entire game. And it was all over in about two and a half hours, but I suppose that worked in its favour, because I remember thinking that if the game went on much longer after that fucking robot gorilla boss fight then I was going to kick it down a flight of stairs. Perhaps it should have aspired to be even shorter. Hell, if it had melted as soon as I opened the box it might even have gotten five stars. Still, 70 bucks for two and a half hours would bring tears to the eyes of an investment banker as surely as a kick in the trust fund. Normally at this point I'd get my narc on about the modern games industry's ongoing habit of reducing the actual meat and potatoes of the games for the sake of a shinier plate, but Star Fox Zero's graphics look like fried shite. The models and level design look like something from two or three generations ago with the textures buffed up a bit. I can't think how this game could possibly be taking up the whole disc. Maybe this is all part of some sinister master plan to smuggle illegally downloaded episodes of Keeping Up Appearances into the country. No, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but then neither does the publishers thinking the game held up alright. The only positive I have is that the final dogfight with the evil animal flying squad across the surface of totally not the Death Star was alright. Otherwise the broad impression of Star Fox Zero effort is that it's just not trying hard enough where it counts, and too hard where it doesn't. And I'm only asking to be met halfway, Star Fox, because I'm trying not to punch you off a bridge. Oh dear, it's one of those gap-in-the-schedules kinds of weeks. Well, there was Battleborn, but you know. Multiplayer-focused, MOBA-inspired, by the guys who made Borderlands the Pepsi to Overwatch his Coke. That's not my bag, like three times over, as the frustrated old woman said to the forgetful lost property attendant, and I doubt my opinion holds much value. Of course, the game does say we're perfectly welcome to play it single-player, but I've fallen for that one before, haven't I? Like with Evolve and Star Wars Battlefront, which technically do have single-player, in the same way that a hotel room does technically have a B-Day if they hire someone to lie on the bathroom floor and spit up your asshole. So it's been a while, let's retro-review, and since we just did 
said a Nintendo game, let's remind ourselves of a time when Nintendo didn't gargle quite so much hot motion control piss gravy and spat it out all over our aching wrists. It's 2004, it's the GameCube, a console with several very decent games you'll find very difficult to get hold of and play these days, which is in some way in service of progress, and incidentally you could run faster if you weighed less, so why not cut one of your legs off? It's a game that I'm constantly bringing up whenever we talk about RPGs, Mario games and RPG Mario games, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door. The second game in the Paper Mario series that continued the Mario RPG tradition that began on the snares with, brace yourself, Super Mario RPG. A collaboration between Nintendo and Squaresoft, which explains why it was simultaneously cutesy and fucking incomprehensible. Paper Mario, meanwhile, was developed by Intelligent Systems, who it turns out had some pretty good ideas despite their company having the dreariest fucking name in the history of game development. The Paper Puppet Theatre aesthetic was a lot more appealing than Mario RPG's 3D pre-rendering, a style that looked good for about the 12 nanoseconds after Donkey Kong Country came out and then looked like Playmobil people sliding around a breakfast tray. But the reason why I hold up Paper Mario 2 as the peak of Mario RPG is that while Nintendo are a stubborn lot that retread their old ground so much that they've worn down a trench deep enough for a fucking Fallout shelter, something magical happens on the rare occasions when they do try building some continuity. Look at the N64 Zeldas, Ocarina of Time had to re-establish all the same old shit, Link, Zelda, Burble Bomb, Ganon, Triforce, Bomble Boo, but once they'd gotten that shit out of the way, they did Majora's Mask in the same continuity and that actually had some really good original ideas and themes. And the same thing happened with Paper Mario, the first one had to get the tired old status quo bullshit out of the way, Bowser kidnaps Princess, Mario mounts highly circuitous rescue attempt that will inevitably involve collecting stars, for it is always stars, but once that was established they could do Thousand Year Door, same continuity, some actual new fucking ideas, for you see Nintendo you'll never break your shoes in properly if you keep rebooting every five minutes. How's about this for breaking the mould? Princess Peach gets kidnapped, right, by somebody other than Bowser. BAM! And the seven stars you have to collect are seven crystal stars this time, fucking hell guys, rein the creativity in before it starts triggering miscarriages. Alright, admittedly the broad strokes of the game aren't that much different to Paper Mario 1 and it was Super Paper Mario that really shook the formula up. Thousand Year Door still applies Paper Mario 1's turn-based combat of the temporary pocket dimension variety with the usual Mario RPG innovation that you can press a button in time with the hits to do more damage or take less, which is about as far as turn-based combat can innovate without turning into one of those god-awful turn-based real-time hybrid systems of the Nino Kunis of the world. Still, over time the Mario RPGs couldn't resist escalating the mechanics so that attacks require more and more ridiculously elaborate minigames, the Mario and Luigi series have run this right into the fucking ground, and now the super attacks in those games are like supervising a temperamental Heath Robinson machine. But in Thousand Year Door, the worst it gets is probably the Earthquake attack, which is the best all-purpose damage dealer for most of the game, but getting the full effect requires playing five minutes of Parappa the Rapper. The combat's also lent depth by the badge system that allows Mario's fighting style to be heavily customised, but considering virtually every enemy has some specific immunity, the only practical fighting style is all of them. But the fact is, the combat almost doesn't matter. An RPG must have some, and hey, there it is. It's the story and writing that have the edge. Considering that Nintendo these days treat their first party IP like it's the priceless family silver and don't even use it for special occasions now because it's just about the only thing they have left to pawn, it's amazing to look at what Thousand Year Door and other Mario RPGs managed to get away with while flying the official Mario flag. Thousand Year Door pretty swiftly goes off the usual rails, you know what I mean, grasslands, desert, ocean, jungle, my Sharona. Yeah, the first stage is much of the grasslands about it, and then you fight a dragon in the castle, but it's not too long after that before you get to the chapters where Mario takes up a career in professional wrestling or investigates Agatha Christie mysteries on a moving train. Super Paper Mario was even more offbeat with its settings, but Thousand Year Door found the best balance between the irreverent funny laughs and building an actual cohesive world that's more than just a vehicle for the silliness. The hub town around which the game revolves is not a cheerful smurf village where the generic mushroom people live the eternal paradox of how one builds a pastel-coloured sugar plum cottage with no opposable thumbs, but a cosmopolitan pirate town in the grip of sleaze and organised crime. There's even a dirty great gallows in the town centre which is a bit dark, although considering all the Mario monsters that can fly or have no discernible neck, there's only about five dudes it could have been used on. This is also the game in which Princess Peach is about as sexualized as she'll ever be in an official Mario game, and in that I include Super Mario Sunshine in which Bowser's kid claims to have come out of her vagina, and tellingly she doesn't deny it. In between Mario's chapters you briefly play as Princess Peach in the villain's hideout finding a way to send help or information to the outside world, and she's able to do this because early on the villain's computer spies on her taking a shower and then spends the rest of the game contriving new reasons for her to take her clothes off. It might sound exploitational to you, but I think she comes across rather well. She's a diplomat, not a fighter, and she's finding opportunities to leverage the upper hand, making full use of the assets she has available. Both of them, in fact. She'd last longer than Mario in Game of Thrones. She'd have a strategic marriage in the bag before you can say nudity claws. The one thing everyone knows about Naughty Dog as a developer is that they've never had a franchise outlive a console. They tossed in Crash Bandicoot with the PS1, Jack and Daxter went down on, I mean down with the PS2, and Uncharted was a creature of the PS3 until now. So what does it mean when a Naughty Dog franchise spreads onto another console generation? That fire will soon rain from the sky and I shall behold a great beast rising from the ocean with seven heads and seven tragic early 2000s haircuts? Or it could just mean that the new console generation is wank that has made no significant steps forward and has chosen instead to lie down on the floor and look for treasure in its belly button. Anyway, Uncharted 4 is very decisively the final 
game in the series about exploring marvellous lost cities in many exotic international locations while controlling an insufferable murdering pillar whose dialogue is 10% smug quips and 90% exertion noises. And Uncharted 4 has concluded that the insufferable pillar is the part we're invested in. I feel this is making the same mistake as the new Tomb Raiders, trying to focus on the protagonist of the adventure story rather than the adventuring part. Claim to be invested in Lara Croft's character all you like, but you know you'd rather watch her out running an avalanche than talking earnestly about her commitment issues. I mean, strip the adventure out of Uncharted 4 and it's just people with no idea how to communicate with each other the game. I know that's kind of the point when Nathan Drake creates a rift with his wife by not telling her he's going on an adventure, but towards the end, when they're together again and are having a big reconnecting scene, these people who've been married for years still can't fucking communicate. All they do is quip and talk into their shoes. It makes me fucking cringe. I want to step in, shove them aside, and do the dialogue myself with sock puppets. If you dropped a Shakespearean character into the Uncharted universe, they would stand out like a neon pink Johnny in a cucumber patch. Come join me now, ye gentles all, and crouch behind yon chest-high wall. So you're out of luck if you're not interested in Nathan Drake as a person and would rather get on with the action and adventure part of the action adventure, because before things kick off you've got two flashback chapters to get through and then a chapter in which Nathan Drake bums around the house being mildly frustrated. You know what though, I talk shit, but I was actually starting to like the bastard during that whole segment. I want to see more of the boring suburban life of the ex-douchebag adventurer. It's like Han Solo getting dropped into the middle of an Alan Bennett production. When his long-lost brother shows up and pulls him back into the thug life, I was rooting for Nate to tell him to piss off and go back to browsing the Ikea catalogue. But no, you can't keep a good mass murderer down and things swiftly descend into the usual mix of linear climbing sequences, gun battles and elaborate puzzles created by ancient explorers with apparently very little else to do with their lives. You may already have picked up on the potent whiff of retcon in the air. Nathan Drake having an older brother who was his inseparable partner well into their adult careers is something that might have been worth mentioning in the flashback sequence of the previous game, when Nathan Drake was a street kid ostensibly all alone in the world, but I suppose if I tanked as many blows to the head as Nathan Drake does, I'd probably lose count of how many relatives I've got too. Nathan's brother needs his help to pay off an evil dictator, so they set off in search of a buried pirate treasure, which rather illustrates my earlier point, because buried pirate treasure is the kind of placeholder plot that gets yelled over the head writer's shoulder as he hurriedly exits the planning meeting at bang on the hour the bar opens. So the game takes a long time to get going, and maybe too long overall, because by the end I was going, Jesus Christ this game's long, which is the usual sign of being overlong. Then again, I could just have been bored by the continual string of incredible stunts and chase sequences in picturesque exotic locales, because the series has already taken it up past 11 more than once, and I'm not talking about bedtimes, so Uncharted 4 can't help feeling like we're repeating ourselves. After the mythical lost cities of the last three games, we're after a B-grade treasure at best, hence I suppose the focusing on Drake as a character. But the problem with that is, he's a pillock! There's yet another prolonged flashback chapter in the mid-game, where we learn the circumstances under which he and his brother took the name Drake and began adventuring, and it's treated like the moment when Bruce Wayne sees a bat flapping about and decides, as any sensible person would, to start wearing black pyjamas and a bucket on his head. For me, it's like having a drawn-out flashback scene revealing the exciting origin of his trousers. I didn't think it was that important, I just assumed he put them on that morning because his ballet tights were in the wash. If it weren't for all the character stuff being used as a crutch, I could take Uncharted 4 out of the larger context of the series where it would probably fare better because it wouldn't get so bloody predictable. Oh look, an area full of conspicuous chest-high walls before a puzzle room. A glib assurance from Nathan Drake that the villains can't possibly catch up with us now. I wonder if completing this puzzle will serendipitously coincide with them doing that very thing. You can definitely see the influence the new Tomb Raiders have had, as the major mechanics besides the climbing and the shooting include swinging on ropes and sliding down hills on our slab-like masculine buttocks. The combat's got the good old stealth focus again, and of course we have plenty of entirely linear, predetermined action sequences very artfully disguised as open-ended ones, but I can't get up its ass too much, because I know this is the kind of game I miss when I'm having to play shit like The Division and other games that one should be very strongly advised not to play prior to operating heavy machinery. I couldn't call Uncharted boring, but it has now done all it can do, in which case, well done for ending it, and that's pretty conclusively ended, because it's got the kind of epilogue you can't roll back from without a time machine, or more realistically, a particularly exorbitant check from Sony. Happily, the developers made all my dreams come true by having an American as the main villain, hooray! And all of his henchmen as South Africans, boo! Oh well, no one gets along with South Africans, least of all other South Africans, but even without the us versus foreigners subtext, there's still something obnoxious about Uncharted. Possibly it's the self-congratulatory air, as characters laugh at each other's non-jokes and say things like, my, what incredible scenery, I definitely wouldn't regret the purchase of any console that could render shit like this. There's even a bit where you have to play Crash Bandicoot, which is about the most blatantly masturbatory thing a developer can do, short of put packets of their own jizz in the box. Something to think about for the special edition, lads. Doom, and I still hate the practice of sequels with identical names, so from now on I will refer to it as Doom, was promising to be the kind of classic style FPS that I enjoy very much, which immediately made me suspicious. You're a hardcore retro shooter focusing on fast pace and mobility while fighting off hordes of monsters? Well, it won't be truly retro unless it's level-based with open-ended maps and key hunting. Oh, it does have that. Alright then, but you couldn't resist having weapon reloading, that's the one thing that shooter developers always put in these days without considering how it screws up the pace of, oh, there's no reloading. Alright, what the fuck are you up to, Bethesda? For me, this is like when an attractive young woman comes up to me in a bar and says, you know, I am so attracted to aging, socially awkward, hairy men who play too many video games, why not buy me a drink and then perhaps a house? Perhaps I've gotten too defensive and cynical from a lifetime of disappointment.
segment, but after playing through Doom, I think I've come to realise that people who come on to me might not necessarily be gold-digging harlots. Some of them are just trying to get back at their dad. I didn't know what to expect of Doom, but I did know what I didn't want. I didn't want Doom 3, the game that was 90% pitch blackness and 10% audio logs. So hopes weren't high when Doom opens with the protagonist having to listen to a voice on a computer screen. Until five seconds into the speech, our hero smashes the monitor like a confused gorilla, then starts shooting zombies and never stops. Doom certainly seems to have a firm understanding of its audience, because while there is a plot going on, the player character couldn't give a half ounce of deep fried shit. If you want to know the plot, then pause the game and read all the fluff text in the character and location database, sipping daintily from your delicate pink teacup full of pussy juice, while the game waits patiently for you to strap your bollocks back on and get back in the fray. Not the most organic way to bring story across, but what the hell else could they have done? Have Jiminy fucking Cricket sitting on your shoulder whispering stories in the brief pauses between the sounds of partially muscled bone being crushed between your erect bulletproof nipples? For what it's worth, the plot is, stock amoral corporation sci-fi subcategory 9, Wayland yutani type, has stock evil science motivation subcategory 12, energy crisis and they have found the foolproof and completely unlikely to backfire solution of extracting energy from the Christian afterlife. I don't know why they felt they had to stick to hell. You'd have thought a few solar panels around God's beard would have done the job. Sadly, not Wayland yutani forgets to screen its employees for death metal fans and someone unleashes the hordes of hell on the Mars base. You, meanwhile, are a mythical demon-slaying warrior who was being kept in hell's drunk tank after the last time you smashed the place up, awakened to once again show the demons what for, and dress up like a Lego astronaut. Doom's gameplay is a surprisingly faithful update of the original Dooms. No, you couldn't double jump in the originals, but you could could move faster than a conservative political campaigner through a minority district, so it's still in the spirit of things. The combat is distinctly mechanics focused, it doesn't make conventional sense that chainsaw murders make the victim burst into piles of ammunition or that smashing their head in makes them disgorge bandages and Mars bars, but it does from a mechanical perspective, because the chainsaw is what you use when you're low on ammo, and brutal murder is the game's intended solution for moments of high stress, as well as moments of low stress and all the moments in between. I wasn't sure about the whole glory kill thing. They're called glory kills for one thing, which sounds like what you'd call stabbing someone to death with your knob through a hole in a cubicle wall, but they're actually pre-animated takedown moves, a thing that modern action games persist in having that have a tendency to kill the pacing as assuredly as a passport checkpoint on a roller coaster. To Doom's credit, they are very quick, it's more an Israeli passport checkpoint than an American one, but considering you can glory kill every single fucking monster just by getting their health low, it gets repetitive. Maybe it should have been more of a reward, like in Resident Evil 4 how you have to kneecap dudes before you can suplex them. It stops being memorable when I kill every single Baron of Hell by pulling their horn off and wimpily swiping their face with the wet end, like I'm giving them a dirty Sanchez. Actually, before I continue with my list of whinging nitpicks, perhaps I should clarify clarify that I do recommend Doom, and had more fun with it than I've had with most AAA shooters lately, and that being the case, it would be remiss of me not to list what issues I did have, but none of them are deal breakers and it doesn't actually bother me that much that most of the NPC dialogue sounds like they're trying to do an impression of Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget. Okay? Okay. The loading times were a bit of an arse, and in levels with jumping puzzles over instant kill death pits there are a lot of an arse, but they were a triple stacked arse with whipped butter on the side when the game was treating me hammering the ledge grab button as more of a blue sky suggestion than a command. Relatedly, this is definitely a game that benefits from having the mouse and keyboard rather than the controller because the controller's best suited to wheeling yourself around an arena like a runaway dessert trolley on a chest high wall safari, not so much for simultaneously jumping one way, looking in another, grabbing a ledge, shooting a dude and tying up your shoelaces. The game's a little bit crazy with the upgrades, there's character upgrades, runes that give you passive buffs, and the main currency is weapon upgrades. They give that shit away like condoms at a Planned Parenthood clinic. You killed all the monsters, weapon upgrade! You went into a secret, weapon upgrade! You came back out of the secret, weapon upgrade! Why the fuck not? Thing is though, you can only use them to upgrade the special alternate attacks each weapon has, a lot of which I didn't get much use out of when a good hard shotgun blast will answer most of a demon's probing interview questions, but hey, if the tokens are too easy to get but the upgrades are kinda shitty, then I guess those issues cancel each other out. And the upgrades must have been having some effect, because I thought the game was a bit easy by the end, when it felt like it had no more tricks up its sleeve. Oh, goodness, I killed the entire wave of monsters and two barons of hell spawned. This will call upon all my training that I had five minutes ago the last time this happened. The monsters never took me by surprise, the way they'd always spawn in with a red glowy effect, a shower of confetti and an English butler reading their names out loud. I don't want the Doom 3 thing where you pick up a small health pack and six hidden doors fly open to reveal hell's entire buggery squadron, but there's gotta be a middle ground. Oh yeah, and the grenades feel a bit wimpy. I throw it, there's a little foot, and then all the zombies around it fall apart with embarrassment. I think that's it. As I say, my problems are mere flicked bogeys sticking to the edges of a perfectly solid core. Maybe it's rather blatantly pandering to my generation of gamers, but this is the good kind of panda. The kind that gets all the bamboo and has sex once in a while. Well, here's a franchise I never thought would have the balls to show its face around these parts again. Homefront, the contemporary shooter hinging on the ever so slightly balmy premise that North Korea could be a credible threat, rather than the national equivalent of a talkative Counter-Strike player. Oh, but it's alright, it's an alternative universe North Korea that found a whole bunch of money and military tech in a Christmas cracker or something and now wants to muscle a considerably weaker country on the other side of the world, for no adequate reason. But if you're gonna make alt North Korea so wildly different to the real world equivalent, then why even call it North Korea? Call it Bastardstan or Spermany. I feel like the starting point must have been a slightly 
creepy desire to kill North Koreans, and then they had to tortuously contrive a scenario in which the conflict wasn't totally unfair. The first Homefront was a linear shooter about as worth committing to memory as the lyrics to Agadu, and Homefront Revolution seems barely connected at all. Incidentally, well done for using the single most overused subtitle, you fucking- oh hang on, my mistake, it's actually called Homefront THE Revolution. Well that's alright then, carry on. In Homefront World, North Korea is a global centre of tech manufacturing and the US is cripplingly indebted to it. Guys, if you want the villains to be China, just make the villains China. Dancing a 12 foot radius around it is just undignified. Anyway, the People's Republic of Cheria call in the debt, occupy and enslave the US, and you're part of a guerrilla resistance movement to take the country back. The problem is, or rather the first problem on the dizzying pile I've prepared for today, is that while the whole old universe thing asks us to mentally disassociate from the North Korea we're familiar with, we're simultaneously asked us to root for America based on our knowledge of the real world version rather than the deadbeat nationwide slum presented for us here. I don't know, doesn't seem like Korth Norea could run the place any worse. Oh, but the evil lurking behind the friendly facade of the occupying force is revealed in the intro sequence as our character is interrogated by a sadistic torturer before escaping and rejoining the resistance, who mistake us for a spy and take us to be interrogated by their sadistic torturer. And I guess we're supposed to think it's cute this time? What purpose could the sadistic torturer speed dating sequence possibly have except to establish that both sides are cocks, and the schmorth Schmarians at least have better hygiene? So with our investment in the struggle completely not established, the game finally gets going, with a shuddering cough and a little squirt of piss into its pants. Home front of the refrigerator has technical issues the way the Waffen SS had a few bad apples. This is the worst audio mixing I've ever heard in what purports to be a finished game. Is that all you've got, Yatsu? Do you really give that much of a shit about audio mixing? No, I bloody don't. Nobody does. So imagine how god awful the audio mixing has to be that I consider it important to mention. I was being talked to by an NPC on our way down a corridor, and my fucking footstep sounds were drowning out his speech. It was like my shoes were trying to do the Bane voice. But even if you're the kind of biblical messiah who can forgive the sin of bad audio mixing, the frame rate was so awful I could practically hear the clicking of the joints of the old man turning the crank, and the game freezes for five seconds every single time it autosaves, like you're trying to watch a YouTube video on an oil rig, and whenever it happened, every single time I would cross my little fingers and say a little prayer. Please crash. Go on, you pussy. Give me the excuse. No such luck, but Backyard the Renovation is a sandbox game, which are at increased risk of buggering up, so there was always the chance of it buggering itself to death at some point. It's a sandbox shooter in the inevitable liberate all the districts mould, but I wonder if as the medium has evolved, we have rather lost touch with the essential purpose of the sandbox shooter. The word sandbox implies carefree entertainment free of the restrictions of linear game design, and the word shooter implies that the bang bangs will be going into the man mans. But it seems like there's nothing that human the resources wants to avoid more than those two things, with the possible exception of adequate QA testing. The game cheerfully supplies you with shitty standard FPS weapons and puts an emphasis on weapon modding and crafting, and then if you actually try to get into a shootout to make use of it all, you get a clip around the ear, because enemies just keep on coming and your health bar empties faster than a cake shop after your mum gets off the leash. Guerrilla warfare, you idiot! Stop trying to have fun and go hide in a bin! The districts are split between secure yellow zones, where you use stealth to avoid having fun, and contested red zones, where you use motorbikes to avoid having fun. The motorbikes are just there so you can quickly get around without having to fight things. Even if you try to run the enemies over, you go straight through them. It takes quite a bit of effort to make motorbiking around a combat zone not fun, so well done on that front. Home front. In both kinds of districts, liberating the individual regions largely involves finding the one slightly obscure route through a stronghold to press the Liberate Region button, at which point the occupying armed enemy soldiers all shrug their shoulders and piss off. Well, maybe all your resistance chums get so inspired by your button pressing prowess that they chase the baddies away, but frankly, I doubt it, because I saw the resistance in action, and inaction is precisely the word for it. You can enlist passing resistance members to aid you, and I attempted this precisely once, because my new chum spent the whole time consistently standing in the doorway I was trying to get through. Yes, the buggery continues, the AI in this game would struggle to pass remedial colouring in lessons. The characters must all have hitboxes like brick chimneys because they can get stuck on discarded crisp packets. The one incident which was the defining moment of the game for me took place in a resistance hideout, where I guess I'd forgotten to flush the toilet properly before I left because two NPCs came over and pinned me to a wall. They both stood staring at me, refusing to move, and every time I tried to get past them they'd hurl foul-mouthed abuse. Well fuck you too, game! If I wanted this treatment I'd have attended my brother's wedding! And if Hurdy the Gurdy doesn't end up in the year's bottom five then it's a fucking depressing six months ahead. The problem, by which I mean the rancid underlying problem, upon which all the other problems scuttle and defecate, is that it's chasing a trend that we've already left behind. No one wants contemporary shooters anymore, Battlefield has decided it's going to wring some fun out of World War One, and good luck to them, because that's like wringing apologetic tears out of Hillary Clinton, while Call of Duty is off to fight Zargon warships on the planet shithouse. Meanwhile, the success of Doom and Overwatch shows a lean towards good old-fashioned fast-paced fun violence on a layer of shrink-wrapped bum cheeks. Homefront of the Revolution is just a game that's past its time. Its time was 1346 AD when the Black Death broke out. 
Yes, I know what I said a couple of weeks back about not doing Battleborn or Overwatch, but that was an easier thing to say when I wasn't staring down the dismal tunnel of inevitable mid-year drought like a gynaecology student cramming for the final exam. My argument was, as someone who has never seen the appeal in the standard multiplayer game structure of playing the same mission over and over again in the hope of one day becoming as skilled as the insufferable passionless cunts that infest the servers, my opinion on games that focus on such is akin to Freddy Krueger's opinion on electric hair straighteners, but then I thought, hang on, maybe there is value in me playing two different flavours of the suddenly inexplicably popular multiplayer hero shooter genre, and stating as a confessed outsider which one I enjoyed more. So with this brief in mind, I played some Overwatch and some Battleborn, and I just know that before this review is over I'm going to slip up and call it Bloodborne. Even as I'm writing this fucking sentence I'm having to open Steam and determine whether or not you spell Battleborn with an E on the end. Anyway, the plan was to spend each afternoon this week playing a bit of Battleborn and then a splotch of Overwatch in their respective multiplayer modes with nostrils firmly clenched. This ran into the immediate stumbling block that Battleborn servers are as lively as a swingers sex party in the hip replacement ward. Yes, if there were hopes for a Coke and Pepsi style rivalry between the games, they seem to have been well and truly dashed. The loser already poured down the sink to provide sewer rats with slightly claggy aftertaste forevermore. But people seem to be down on Battleborn from the moment it came out and I'm not sure I understand why. I mean, yes, the gameplay is utterly boring and the menus are horribly designed and the dialogue writer's idea of creating personality is to make every character talk like Buffy the fucking vampire slayer, but in other words, it's an entirely typical Gearbox game. I thought the same things of Borderlands, and I seem to be the only person in the world who didn't like that bollocks. No, the fact is, Overwatch has had media coverage that would bring envious tears to the corpse of Princess Diana, and a doctrine has come down from the United Nations demanding everybody like it or have sanctions placed on their international trading, so Battleborn was preemptively dismissed as a cash-in imitator, to be considered alongside Chinese bootlegs of superhero action figures named things like Spoderman and Batfellow, which I don't think is fair. Yes, both games sell themselves on a big roster of colourful playable characters, but then fighting games have been doing that for as long as my parents have stopped having sex. They are both first-person shooters, but otherwise the experience is quite different. Battleborn allows single player significantly, although the maps are expansive and every NPC with dialogue refers to you with plural pronouns, so it does have a bit of that slightly depressing air of going to a theme park by yourself. Overwatch, meanwhile, has Team v Team multiplayer, and that's it. And while I can respect wanting to focus on doing one thing really well, rather than everything blandly, I'm iffy about selling such a game for full price. Its mentor Team Fortress 2 never cost 70 fucking bucks, even before it was free, and Overwatch has micropayment sales on top of that. Blizzard must rack up a lot of maintenance costs polishing up those massive brass balls of theirs. I miss the days when video games were a thing that you bought and then owned, rather than something you are temporarily permitted to occupy in return for tithes and devotion, as you pray that your meager offerings please the gods and stave off the inevitable coming of the great server shutdown. Battleborn has a series of campaign missions to go through in turn and only unlocks a handful of its characters at the start, while Overwatch splatters all its content and gameplay at you in one go. Overwatch strips naked in the doorway and goes for you like a jumping spider, Battleborn totters into the lounge wearing 17 sweaters. I liked that Overwatch gave me a practice range where I could play each character in turn and figure out which one I liked the feel of, where all I could do at the outset of Battleborn was start a story mission, arbitrarily pick someone, and hope that they're not one of the ones that needs other players around to push their wheelchair. The gameplay has a Mamorpagree feel in that the missions all feel like I'm doing an instance in World of Warcraft, streams of identical mobs broken up by the occasional mini-boss, and environments with really unfeasibly big furniture. Plus a lot of special attacks that boil down to hurt enemy, hurt enemy slightly more, and hurt several enemies who didn't figure out not to stand in the conspicuous glowing circle. Each character in Overwatch, meanwhile, has three or four refined skills that all go toward making them good at one specific thing, so all the characters have to be unlocked from the start, because otherwise it'd be like having to unlock one of the wheels on your car. In summary, the difference is that Battleborn is a game of unlocking stuff and Overwatch isn't. You unlock characters, you unlock their skills, and their skills reset every mission so you can have all the fun of unlocking them again. Maybe the way one character delivers their annoying quips endears them to you enough that you might want to unlock their backstory by completing various grind challenges, which seems like a pretty good way to make them less endearing really fucking fast. Overwatch only has cosmetic unlocks and the system for that is frankly insulting. I play round after round, murder legions of my fellow man, woman and monkey cyborg, and for my efforts I'm awarded one loot box containing two banana stickers and a pink leotard for a character I hate. Mind you, I got more use out of those banana stickers putting them around the spawn waiting for the round to start than I did out of the gear I was unlocking in Battleborn, which promised to temporarily shave 0.7 seconds off my ball scratching time if I could ever figure out how to equip the fucking things. I think it's safe to say that in the gameplay event Overwatch takes the trophy and covers it in banana stickers before Battleborn can even unlock its running shoes. But Battleborn has a plot where Overwatch just has a paragraph on a website talking some guff about a robot invasion, giving bugger all explanation for why these dudes are arbitrarily teaming up to fight clones of each other. Remember that little controversy when Blizzard cut out a pose of a character sticking her bum out because one person complained? That annoyed me. Not because of my personal bum preferences, but because making a change after one solitary complaint shows just how little shit they gave about artistic vision. Every character is an archetype cynically designed to pander to some section of the audience. There's the obvious eye candy girlies wearing cling film, but there's also a muscle lady and a chubby girl in specs, so the gender specials don't throw a strop. Then we'll have two samurais and a mecha girl for the weeaboos, a cowboy for dudes with slightly weird ideas about the masculine ideal, and a skull-faced murderer for dudes
dudes with even weirder ideas about the masculine ideal. In contrast, Battleborn's cast is scrappier, but consequently comes across as more human and less focus grouped up the cling film covered arse. But at the end of the day, you can't argue with fun, and Overwatch is plainly and simply more fun than blood bo- oh, Almost did it there, didn't I? I meant Battleborn isn't as fun as Hovercrotch. Uh, overpriced. Continuity is a bit like getting the pornography channel on a hotel room television. We can all agree it's nice to have, but if it's not there, it's difficult to explain why it's so important to you. You might reasonably wonder what relation Mirror's Edge Catalyst has to the original Mirror's Edge. Is it a sequel, or a prequel, or a reboot, or a soft reboot, or a hard reboot, or a traumatically invasive reboot behind the bike sheds? And the answer is, good old plain reboot classic. So it's the same main character in the same city with the same red and white colour scheme reminiscent of a wedding party massacre, and broadly speaking the same plot, just with a new cast of secondary characters and all the relationships muddled around a bit. I wondered if they'd brought the same writer back from the first one, the one who did the new Tomb Raiders, because their usual hallmarks were there, protagonist is annoying, has daddy issues, and spends the whole game panting down our ear like a malfunctioning hairdryer, but by the end I realised it couldn't have been them writing it because I'd started to like one or two of the characters. So take note, 2008 is officially far back enough to justify a reboot, but not so far back that they could get away with using the same title without an utterly meaningless word bolted on the end. Seems a bit fussy to reboot continuity after one fucking game, god forbid we stop indecisively slapping the buttocks of an intellectual property and actually start making headway towards getting a whole fist up there to rummage a Around. Maybe they felt their new story was just too good to not use, but I doubt that, because I found I could mouth along to the hackneyed plot points. Oh look, a cocky new partner whom we initially dislike. Circle correct answer. We will A. Gradually gain mutual respect as we learn to work together, or B. Turn into pirate flamingos and mount a voyage to the Caspian Sea. Anyway, if you need getting up to speed, Mirror's Edge is set in an oppressive, worker-exploiting corporate future world, and it's published by EA, relatedly. An underground network of couriers undermine the corporate stranglehold via an off-the-grid delivery service, and we play one such courier named Faith, whose sexual partner probably have a good laugh when they get together. Do you have faith? Yes, I'm having faith as we speak. I used to have faith, but I got disillusioned after I got my results back from the clinic. The evil corporations are brewing an evil corporate scheme and we can only hope that it's a scheme that can be foiled by doing parkour at it. Yes, Mirror's Edge is a first-person parkour up and the plot runs into the recurring issue that there are only so many situations that running somewhere very fast can assist with. The game's missions have many varied story reasons behind them, but in practical terms most of them are completed by running up to the right computer and mashing our hand on the screen. There's a memorable mission when Faith is working with the resistance as they set out to kidnap some evil corporate type, a fairly significant development that drives most of what remains of the plot. But since at no point in the process of kidnapping someone does parkour become necessary, the whole thing takes place off screen, with Faith tasked to instead, open quotes, clear the path by, you guessed it, following a parkour path to a series of computers and mashing her hand on each screen. You get to listen to the kidnapping through your earpiece, as you gaze heavenwards and dream about what it would be like to be the main character of this story. Still, I suppose I shouldn't encourage the game to parkour outside its comfort zone, since it attempts to do that with the combat, and in doing so, parkour straight into a brick wall. The combat was the metaphorical anchovy in the trifle last time around as well, and why on earth wouldn't it be? You're a tiny unarmed personal trainer in climbing shoes, whose superpower is possessing the speed of one person on roller skates. Why the hell should we be expected to take on four fully equipped riot cops in a straight fight? The game even suggests at times that the smartest thing to do is just keep running, maybe give the thug squad a cheeky smack on the bum as you glide past, and I'm fine with that, but I suppose someone thought it would be hard to justify putting all this work into armour designs and the prerequisite pre-animated takedowns if it's all just going to be streaking past like the end of 2001. So every now and again they lock you in a room for a few rounds with the goon squad, and what do you know? It turns out that a skinny unarmed girl with a reduced perception of her surroundings that inevitably comes of a first person perspective will probably get passed around like a plate of canapes. What an informative science experiment this has been. And you can't use guns anymore, so if an enemy has one, your only option is to sprint into melee range and hope you did enough press ups that morning to dissuade six or seven unavoidable bullets to the face. Gosh, so much to be unimpressed by, I haven't even mentioned that it's a sandbox game yet. Which I thought would be a good idea, since a free running game that's strictly linear with only one way forward makes about as much sense as buying a dog to guard your lawn against getting pissed on. But Mirror's Edge Catastrophic ends up being pretty linear regardless, since it's more of a spaghetti plate than a sandbox, the routes you're supposed to take around the maps are fairly fixed and you're going to be using the same ones an awful lot, the environments are confusingly laid out and a little bit samey, turns out there aren't that many different shades of overexposed blinding whiteness, and I found myself being almost completely reliant on the GPS navigation, at which point all I'm doing is mindlessly following the magic red snake to my destination. And I've had a lot of traumatic experiences come out of strangers telling me to find their magic red snake. Unlike then, though, sometimes in Mirror's Edge catalepsy, the magic red snake will mysteriously go away and I have to stop dead and gormlessly look around for it, like a meerkat waiting for his Uber driver. Which is particularly annoying when you're on a timed mission, for some reason all the side quest runs and deliveries have timers like your mum's beachwear in that they're rather upsettingly tight. I know there's supposed to be a bit more challenge in the optional shit, but there's got to be some fucking middle ground, as the economist said to the American class system. Still, at least we're not expected to liberate the fucking districts like every other sandbox game and their dog these days. I want to turn that into a euphemism. He dropped his trousers and proceeded to 
liberate the districts all over the new carpet. But if we're not liberating the districts, then what the fuck are we doing in this city? Fannying about? Well, that's the idea of a sandbox, I suppose, but the story campaign is over quickly and the character upgrades are pretty minimal, so there's nothing I can feel like I'm working towards. Let me throw out some bones here. That's not a euphemism, pull your pants back up. The story is better than the first game and the parkour's fine. I like it even. It's cathartic, but at the same time calls for an appropriate amount of skill. But it's the only string to the game's bow, and it can't carry a whole sandbox, which is ironic for a delivery service. Here is a joke that I just made up. What's the difference between E3 and a pen full of excited pigs fighting over the stinking corpse of a sheep? Microphones! In all seriousness though, while I must again dutifully walk up to the pig pen and ready my castrating shears, it's looking like most of the pigs already curled up and nibbled their own balls off. There was something very half-hearted about the show this year, it's almost like publishers have realised that they could make all their announcements on the back of a used envelope at midnight on Remembrance Sunday, and the excitable little spurt burglars of the internet will still start ejaculating out of their eyeballs. Nintendo stopped physically showing up to the annual swimsuit contest years ago, preferring to send pre-recorded videos like an ISIS execution squad, and this year they could barely summon the effort to do that, with just a live stream. The very conspicuously didn't mention the upcoming NX console, but made it about the games, or in real terms, game. Yes, stem thy frothing nostrils, ye predictable fanboy sods. The Wii U's finally getting that fucking Zelda game you want so much, although it is going to have to share it with the NX, which at this point could be anything from an upgraded Wii U to a dancing bear in a fez. Sony also absentmindedly failed to bring up the rumoured PlayStation 4.5, and if I were them I'd have at least given it a fancy code name, like Project Buttery Thighs, just so we could call it something less tedious. Otherwise, a few updates on things we already knew about, PlayStation VR, a real no crossed finger backseas release date for Last Guardian, which will now have to come free with the clone of Jesus to live up to the weight, and the corpse of Silent Hills has emitted a couple of unexpected farts. Kojima Productions announced something called Death Stranding, with the emphasis on Thing, a let's charitably call it a proof of concept, which proves very little except that Kojima shouldn't watch so many music videos. And then there's Resident Evil 7, which has boldly leapt into Silent Hills' as smoking shoes with a new and yet hauntingly familiar playable teaser in a first-person spooky house. A style shift worked wonders for Resident Evil 4, but this is a shift so radical that even calling it Resident Evil borders on duplicitous, except for the fact that the game is now literally about an evil residence. Still, what else could they do? Follow on from Resident Evil 6? That'd be like trying to serve dessert after the main course consisted of filet of asbestos in dog shit. Of the big lads in the playground, Microsoft was the only one still turning in its schoolwork, but with pimping the X-Bone's cellulite-covered ass officially written off as a lost cause, we're being introduced to two younger, hotter sisters, the Slimline 1S, where the S presumably stands for stick it up your bum, and a slightly upgraded model called Project Scorpio. If you're going with the Zodiac names, Microsoft, then personally I would have gone with Cancer. What's with all these announcements for not quite next generation updated consoles? Is the big idea to turn this into the smartphone industry, where we buy a new one every two years because they slightly upped the resolution and smoothed another corner off? I'm not going to do that, assholes, because I don't keep my smartphone in a nest of cables under the TV that I'm loath to venture into without a native guide into Wix provisions. On the other hand, Microsoft have also declared that Xbone games will be playable through Windows 10 and the console may even get mouse and keyboard support, which indicates that Microsoft's plan may be to become a developer of gaming PCs so gradually that nobody notices. Getting back to the subject of VR, I still think it's a way forward but the push towards it is starting to remind me of the push towards motion controls and that makes me uneasy, like my preferred political candidate got endorsed by Hitler. I do wish they'd stop trying to pair VR with motion controls, cause that path never ends. You can buy hand puppet controllers and a treadmill and force feedback vests until your living room has more wires running through it than a foreign embassy in Moscow, and then you'll realise you can't smell the in game gore so you hire beautiful Filipino boys to slaughter chickens under your nose, and it still won't be as immersive as a standard button controller that you barely have to think about. And I don't think there's any reason the game should be exclusive to VR, because I'm sure there are plenty of people who'd want to play it but don't want to take a break every two hours for a nice cleansing puke. Anyway, that Star Trek Bridge Operations game intrigued me, in a slightly shameful Dad's train set sort of way, but of all the generations of Star Trek we could pretend to be in, we're stuck with Reboot Trek! That's like inviting the Spice Girls to an orgy and only Sporty Spice shows up! Speaking of Dad games, what's with God of War to turning into The Last of Us. Kratos hefting his massive new beard around, teaching his moist son how to hunt. All I could think about as I watched him slowly trudge through pretty environments having Sony branded character building moments and being a bad dad was the start of the original God of War, in which Kratos was in a room full of monsters, yelled, monsters are a thing that I kill, and that was it, straight into gameplay to start bouncing them around like kittens in a candy floss machine. These first five minutes of gameplay videos don't count for a whole lot if those five minutes are wholly unrepresentative of the rest of the game. I mean, we all know damn well that kid's not gonna survive past the second act, because it wouldn't be a God of War game if Kratos wasn't using deicide as impromptu bereavement counselling. Right, what else? Did someone trip over the wires that were making Sony Tron 3000 remember that zombies are completely overdone? Because that's the only explanation I can think of for Days Gone, whose principal selling point seems to be it is a zombie sandbox, apparently unaware that Dead Rising 4 and State of Decay 2 were doing shots in the next room. Christ, it's not even the first zombie sandbox with the word day in the fucking title! Relatedly, Ubisoft continues to scream the word sandbox every time someone enters the room, like a malfunctioning Furby, despite Assassin's Creed having been let off the milking machine for a quick 
stag around the meadow. Watch Dogs is getting a sequel based on the principle that shit is a good fertiliser. And I see they've abandoned the boring hero strategy for the blisteringly irritating hero, who's watched too many Johnny Lee Miller films approach. You know what? E3 2016 was a show of names. Lots of familiar names, some with incremental numbers on the end, some without. And I know that's pretty much the case every year, but there was an unusual spike in familiar names appearing over totally unfamiliar things. Resident Evil has never been Hoarders meets the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Prey was a lot of things, most of them retarded, but none of them are evident in what is now being referred to as Prey. And since Doom, Bethesda clearly feel they're onto a good thing, wiring up their milking machines to old id properties, but Quake Champions seems to have bugger all to do with the original Quake, and bugger lots to do with Overwatch being more successful than the MMR vaccine. If they keep this up, then soon we'll enter a world where names are totally fucking meaningless, which will come as a relief to my friend, Patrick Child Molester, 